Greetings, everybody, earthlings in a pandemic. Greetings from Photos with Stories and Jay Blakesburg. Here on fans.com and assorted other websites and, and, and um, YouTube channels and Facebook pages. Um, super, super, super excited about my program today because I got my old pal, Blair Jackson, to tell us about the history of the legendary Grateful Dead fanzine, The Golden Road. Uh, before we get to that, I want to do my usual business, which is I want to thank all the people that helped put this on. We got Will Schwerd, who is our video director. Will is typically in New York, but right now in San Diego, finishing up a vacation. Um, and uh, we've got Blair Jackson and his wife, Regan McMahon, who also was a co-founder of The Golden Road in Oakland, California. Thank you, guys. I want to thank the Relic staff for uh, marketing this. Stephanie May, Jonathan Healy, Pete Shapiro, et cetera, et cetera. I want to remind everybody, um, I've got some websites up here, saveourstages.com. This is for independent music venues around the country. Go there, sign up, sign the petition. It costs no money. This is basically to get our politicians, our Congress men and women to um, help fund an initiative to save independent music venues because without government help, there will be nowhere for musicians to play live when this pandemic is over. Um, I'm gonna remind everybody to go to the rexfoundation.org. Every time we do photos with stories, any money that we raise on these shows, we donate to charity. And today we are donating to the Rex Foundation. They, of course, brought us the days between uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago, between Jerry's birthday on August 1st and the 25th anniversary of the day that we lost Jerry, August 9th, 1995. And we did 10 days or nine days of live streaming music, all things Grateful Dead. It was incredible. And that was a Rex Foundation uh, benefit. And lastly, I have this website up here, rockoutbooks.com. That's my website where you can go and buy my books. But more importantly, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later with Blair, we made a temporary store at Rockout Books where you can buy one of nine different uh, editions of The Golden Road. Um, that we have had in storage, Blair has had in storage for decades now. These are collector's items. They're valuable. Um, they're very cool. I highly recommend going in and uh, proceeds from the sales of some of these Golden Roads will go to the Rex Foundation. Um, thank you, Blair and Regan for that. Um, so uh, Blair Jackson, welcome to Photos with Stories. I'm really excited that you're here. Uh, you. I, I first learned about Blair 40 years ago when this article came out in BAM magazine and this article, which is called Deadheads, a strange tale of love, devotion, and surrender came out in April of 1980. And BAM magazine was stood for Bay area music magazine. Uh, and Blair was an editor there. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But when I, when somebody mailed me this issue to me in New Jersey in the spring of 1980, and I read this, it was the first really true and accurate description of who we were as deadheads. By March, by April of 1980, I was fully on tour. I was fully an LSD dealer. I was <laughs> distributing tens of thousands of hits of LSD back in New Jersey to my friends in high school. And I read this article and it was about us. It was about me. It was about my friends. And it just really resonated. And anytime I tried to explain this this phenomena, this thing about deadheads, um, I I show them this article because to me it was really just right on the money. And I just read this again last week, and it's still on the money. It's still valid, relevant, important, and uh, just the dates have been changed. Um, so Blair, welcome. Thank you for coming. It's great to be here. Yeah, they, that uh, that was an interesting article because. Uh, it opened a lot of doors for me with The Grateful Dead. I interviewed uh, Eileen Law extensively for that because she was sort of the liaison with The Grateful Dead. And I interviewed Mickey for it. It was the first time I'd interviewed Mickey. And um, the for the New Year's shows, it was 79 to 80. I went down and interviewed Deadheads in the park, and which was the first time I did this and took a bunch of pictures and all that kind of thing. And... Um, I don't know. It was, it was, it was definitely a labor of love. And I felt like nobody, like you said, nobody had ever really done an extensive article on deadheads at that point. So, uh, so that was it. And, awesome. Uh, so, so Blair grew up in Pelham, New York, which is like lower Westchester County. 
Right. Uh, he started going to see rock and roll in the late 60s. He saw The Doors in January of 1969 at Madison Square Garden. Jimi Hendrix at Madison Square Garden in 69. Like a lot of people, he had an older brother, but he was buying 45s in, in the mid and, and, and mid, early mid 1960s. Um, uh, you know, he was listening to music. He listened to Cousin Brucey on WABC radio, AM radio. He was the hip DJ in New York City. Uh, um, and uh, um, Blair, tell us about um, how you discovered. Uh, actually, no, before we get to that, I want to just mention that, you know, Blair really started getting deep into the Grateful Dead around 1972, although he did see them in 1970. But first, I'm going to flip through some of these photos uh, before we get to uh, that. I, I, you said I got into it deeply in 72. That's that's not accurate. No. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, I'm, <laughs> I'm reading my notes wrong. Um, all right. That was the year that you were your freshman year in college, right? In 72? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Seven, yeah. 71 was actually. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. I want to flip through some of these photos real quick, and then we're going to hand this over to Blair and his first, his first Grateful Dead concert, and he'll bring us back up to history. So this first <laughs> shot here is a shot of Blair at his drafting table. When the Golden Road was created, there were no, well, there were computers maybe, but we weren't using them. There was no desktop publishing. Um, everything was, was laid out by hand. Um, text was laid out with, with rubber, uh, rubber cement and exacto blades. Um, everything in the magazine was pretty much written by Blair and Regan, and they brought in different writers over time. But these guys wrote everything. Um, uh, this is when, they, when an issue came out, all their friends would come over to their house. This is them on the front steps of their house in, in uh, Oakland, California. And uh, they would do parties and mail issues to subscribers. Um, here's Blair and Regan with a bunch of uh, issues um, laying over them. Was this taken for some sort of press thing that you were doing or just for fun? Yeah, this was a uh, cover story for the East Bay Express uh, magazine or newspaper, or whatever, yeah. weekly, East Bay. Right. So a little, they were getting a little bit of press here about what they were doing. Uh, this photo here was taken at the Greek Theater by a photographer named Ron Delaney, who was a big contributor to the Golden Road. Um, that's Blair and Regan about in the middle, all the way over to the left. Regan's got her hands up in ecstasy and Blair's got his- I know the exact up. moment it was taken. Ron, Ron Delaney told me it, it was it was the moment uh, during uh, Might As Well when, it, when he said, never had such a good time and the crowd explodes. So well, there you go. That's why like, Blair's bliss. arms are up and everybody else is in bliss singing along. Never had such a good time in life, my life before. Uh, here's Blair and Regan at Red Rocks. What year is this? 87. 87, and those were the last Red Rocks Dead shows, correct? Uh, yes, I'm going to say yes. So, and, <laughs> and this is an interesting photo here of Regan McMahon um, because of this particular T-shirt she's wearing. This is up in Eugene. Tell me about this particular photo. This is in the parking lot of the Dead Dylan show in 87. Uh, and Regan is wearing a shirt that we bought in the parking lot at Red Rocks in 85, which was our first Red Rocks experience. And it was a bootleg of... Uh, bootleg of the design of cover two of the Golden Road that somebody had turned into a t-shirt. The original design was by uh, Tim Gleason, who was a guy I worked with at, at uh, uh, Mix Magazine. So, right. yeah. And I worked with Tim also at Mix Magazine. I was a freelancer. Blair was the editor of Mix Magazine for 30 something years, right? 32 years. Yeah, 32. Um, after he left Band Magazine, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then here's a photo. This is so classic. And we're gonna see some photos like this about the Grateful Dead from the ticket office. But here are letters to you, whether they're subscriptions with money in them or letters to the editor. And people drew on their envelopes just like they did to the ticket office. Tell me about some of these letters that you were getting from deadheads about the magazine oh, and what you were covering. We would just get these long, soulful letters from everywhere, you know, people in Micronesia. And, you know, uh, we, we kind of struck a chord pretty quickly with with a lot of folks uh, who had been looking for a magazine kind of like the Golden Road. And uh, so they were they were thrilled and everybody has a story to tell. And I guess every, from mailing in for tickets, people were used to uh, decorating envelopes or maybe they just do it out of, you know, just to be creative, you know, they're stoned and sitting around with crayons or something. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, we appreciate it. It was really fun. You know, they don't, most of them didn't quite rise to the level of the amazing stuff that was sent to the ticket office, but that's because they were trying to get tickets from them and not, they weren't trying to get tickets from us. So they nice. were just nice. Um, all right. And on that note, let's go back to a little bit of Blair's history. So um, Blair, pick it up from, uh, pick it up from 1972 when 
Uh, no, we're going to go to the we're going to go to the Capitol Theater in a second. Before we do that, I just want to um, want to bring everybody up to speed with a little bit of your background. So, in '72, you go to college and you have your first experience. Or you're '71, but in '72, you have your first experience on psychedelics. Tell me about that story. Where you went, your your school history, how you ended up in the Bay Area, how you started working for BAM magazine in 1976, I believe it was. Give me a, give me that background there, and then we're going to go back to your first Dead show at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester. Okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll start a little before then. I'll, I'll start as being just kind of a rock and roll fan forever. And uh, uh, in the late 60s, I was a huge fan of the Jefferson Airplane, Quicksilver, Jimi Hendrix, of course, I used to spend endless hours sitting in my basement with my head literally between two speakers, uh, listening to the stereo effects of all these things. I, I was not a pot smoker at this point or anything like that, um, but always liked kind of psychedelic music, loved long guitar solos. I loved early Led Zeppelin, for instance, and kind of tired of them quickly. Um, my first, uh, first, actually, my the first time I ever encountered the Grateful Dead's music was uh, in, in Pelham, they had these dances called pack dances. It was the Pelham Association for Kids. And they were in the little community church hall downstairs. And it, we would, there would always be a band. Would, a lot of times there were people I knew playing music like Tony Sumo and Jack Scarangelo on drums or what, you know, whatever. There were all sorts of folks that I knew uh, who were in bands and we would go and we would dance to them playing Midnight Hour and Knock on Wood. And they were all pretty good actually. There were some really good players. Bobby Rigo, great player. Um, but anyway, at one of these dances, they had what they called a light show, which was a little screen to the side, and they did some projections on it. But one of the things they showed at one of the pack dances was the what turned out, what I learned much later was the Grateful Dead movie, the Grateful Dead film by uh, Robert Nelson the, the, that he shot in 1968 and was used sort of as promotional stuff for Anthem of the Sun. And it was the strangest video. It was, it was them up in uh, Rio Nido or wherever and in canoes and the, the soundtrack was stuff from Anthem of the Sun, which I had never heard. Uh, but I was, I, was, I was super impressed by it. It was, it was, I thought this is truly weird. I love this. But anyway, I didn't really hear uh, The Grateful Dead until uh, Oxa Moxa, um, which my brother bought. And I thought it was okay. I, I don't know. I liked some of it. I love St. Stephen. I love China Cat. There were things about it I really liked. And, you know, I think I was freaked out by what becomes of the baby, what's become of the baby. Um, but I was interested enough that I wanted to go, to go see them. Um, and so the first time uh, we actually, my brother actually bought some tickets for us. My older brother, who was three years older than, us, than me, uh, bought some tickets uh, to see them at the Fillmore, which would have been the January 70 shows. Um, but he got sick and uh, we ended up having to sell our tickets to some friends. So, it, so that did not become my first Grateful Dead show. Uh, instead, my first was in March uh, at the Capitol Theater. Um, but, you know, before that, uh, in, in December, November, December of 69, I bought Live Dead. So I figured, hey, you know, here's a here's here's one song on an entire side of a of a of a double record. This has got to be cool. And with lots of guitar. And I fell in love with Dark Star. I fell in I fell in love with the entire album, basically. And I thought, I've got to see these guys. Uh, so that that became uh, one of my missions was to I've got to see the Grateful Dead. And uh, then it then it came true on. Uh, All right, so let's, let's talk about this. So this is an article that you have in uh, um, uh, in the Golden Road. Uh, no, because we're going to do the covers first. I'm sorry to be out of order. Keep going. Keep going about we'll go back to the we're going anyway, to we're gonna go so back to. So go. You're in college, and All right, so what? So then I I graduated in, uh, from high school in '71, and uh, I go to Northwestern uh, as a freshman in the fall of '71, and I'm carting around the the four Grateful Dead albums I owned, or however many there were at that point, and uh, annoying people in my dorm by playing them loud and constantly. There were there were, there were volume wars between the 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 ELO and uh, I mean, not Electric Light, just the uh, Jethro Tull and uh, ELP fans. You know, they were all playing Tarkus and Aqualung, and I be blasting live dead and you know, I can pl play mine louder than you. And, and uh, anyway, so, you know, college is that experimental time when you, you, you start doing things that you wouldn't do at home. And so eventually in the spring of 72, uh, some friends and I uh, sort of got into psychedelics on a pretty mild level, but it was fun. We'd have, a, we'd do little things like trip around uh, Lake Michigan, which is right off the Northwestern campus. And we'd walk up to the uh, the Baha'i temple in, in nearby Wilmette and just kind of rave around and, and, and stuff like that. And the first time I ever took a psychedelic was a, it's like a half a hit of mescaline and alone. And I went to go see Pink Floyd at the auditorium theater 
in early 1972, they were doing a tour that was called the Eclipse Tour. And this turned out to be the, it was the precursor to the dark side of the moon, which they were recording at that point. And then later they came back and did a dark side of the moon tour too, which was huge, of course, but they were still playing theaters at that point. And so I took mescaline for it and I was sitting in the balcony and I thought, this is very strange. You know, this. And at one point, uh, I remember during the, uh, right near the end, they started passing these giant posters down the aisle. And I was so high that I didn't know what to do. And I just passed it, passed it, passed it, and didn't get one myself. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, the next day, um, I, I, uh, I sort of decided, well, you know, I don't, I don't think I really want to trip for concerts anymore. I was, I was kind of into being analytical. I was, I was already starting to write a little bit about music. And, um, and I thought, well, I don't really know what happened at that show. And Pink Floyd were one of my favorite bands. And I thought, no. Oh. So, so I basically, I didn't uh, trip for, uh, again for a concert in, for 10 years or thereabouts or eight years or something. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's that's my psychedelic story. But uh, nice. All right, and then that brought you from the non-concert settings. Brought you from Northwestern to Tufts, and then eventually you ended up at uh, Cal Berkeley in '73. Is that correct? Right. Yep. yep. All right, and then uh, in '76, so you're getting a master's degree in journalism, but then you get this offer to join the staff of BAM magazine. Right. I had completed all my coursework at the uh, UC Berkeley School of Journalism, and uh, I had always wanted to be. I had, Ever since I my saw, first saw an issue of Rolling Stone in 1969, I thought, I, I want to write about music. I, I want to be these guys who do that. Uh, and so when the opportunity, I, I only wrote a couple of reviews um, before this, uh, before I moved to California. My first ever live review was um, of the Mahavishnu Orchestra at Northwestern, which was the most impossible thing to write ever. I'd never seen them before. <laughs> they have this incredible assault, this cataclysmic world ending music. And you know, somebody once said that uh, it's been attributed to everyone from Thelonious Monk to Frank Zappa that uh, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. And uh, I learned that pretty quick that uh, you really, it's really almost impossible to describe music. Um, but hopefully you can communicate something about either the spirit behind it or how the crowd reacts to it, or uh, uh, you know, you're never going to come up with a really accurate ex uh, description of what a dark star is is really doing, but you can maybe talk about what a dark star is doing to you. Um, and so, th then the job becomes sort of trying to communicate and universalize um, your feelings about things and write it in a language that they can understand. And especially with the Grateful Dead. Like with the Golden Road, I always assumed that there was a certain baseline of knowledge uh, that most people were probably pretty hardcore fans or they wouldn't be reading a Grateful Dead magazine. Um, so you could sort of you could sort of write around things and they would know what you were talking about. If you, if you said oh, the highlight of the set was surprisingly Ramble on Rose, uh, you know, they, they would know that, well, for Ramble on Rose to be the highlight of a set, that, that must mean it was like this. And they can, you know, they can picture it in their mind or whatever. Right. And, uh, yeah. So interesting. So, so you so you finish your classes. You get the job at BAM. Right. Um, I got a job at BAM, and that's why I, dro I dropped out of the. Well, I, I completed all the coursework for the program, and then I had ten years, believe it or not, to write my master's, which was on the was going to be on the uh, the critical reception in America of the Beatles. So it was. And did you write it? Uh, no, I wrote the first chapter of it. And it was pretty good, actually. It was, it was interesting. <laughs> I, I did one uh, cross-country trip one year, one summer, and we stopped in the St. Louis public libraries and dug through all the microfilm yeah. about the, you know, the reviews of them in St. Louis and Kansas City and all these different places. Uh -huh. but, uh, but then it just, uh, once I finally got a job in journalism, uh, working at BAM, uh, probably right. towards the end of 76, they offered me a full-time job. At $100 a week. Something like that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you made it to the big time. It, it seemed like the big time to me, anyway. Um, and weren't you living on frat row in Berkeley in a rooming house? Tell me about that. I was, I was living in a frat row in, on, in, uh, in a rooming house that was uh, run by Scientologists, strangely enough. It was run by, I didn't know this when I signed up, but it was run by a group called Narconon, which was their anti-drug uh, thing. And um, they were pretty strange. They were they would have meetings uh, in the in the main lobby of this had been a former frat house. So they would have you know there would be people sitting knee, knee to knee shouting at each other uh, for these training uh, Scientology training sessions. If you ever saw the movie The Master, it was a lot like that. 
Um, but they, they sort of left me, left me alone, basically. Nice. All right. So you're working at BAM. And in 1978, this new, this new receptionist named Regan McMahon. <laughs> and you guys meet and uh, you take Regan to our first Grateful Dead concert in 1980. Correct. Um, life-changing experience for you guys. Uh, you stayed at BAM until 1983, where you went out to Mix Magazine, where you worked for 32 years as executive editor, senior editor. Oh, or- a whole bunch of different editor editor jobs. Can I just say something about BAM? Sure. Yeah. Well, BAM was was such a great training ground uh, for me, for me and for everybody who was there. It was it was it was so familial. You know, Dennis and Laura, Dennis Erickson and Lori Erickson, uh, who ran the place, were so nice, and you know, it really felt like a family. And uh, we were all kind of learning together. And uh, it was funky, you know, a little bit, you know, we, you know, but that's where Regan and I both learned partially about uh, layout and design because we'd be wandering through the art room and they'd be cutting galleys and waxing them and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they, they were very open about, uh, you know, letting us have our own voices uh, when we wrote things. So even I had some slightly, I would say in those days I had sort of more gonzo tendencies, heavily influenced by Hunter Thompson. And mm-hmm. they allowed me to do that. And uh, so it allowed me to develop as a writer. And it was also the place where I first encountered David Gans, for instance, who, who, who came to BAM and was writing reviews and also doing interviews. He interviewed Robert Hunter, uh, interviewed Bob Weir, all sorts of people who, um, you know, I had not interviewed yet or anything like that. And he was, he was, he was really my entree into Grateful Dead scholarship in a way, uh, just because he was a fellow traveler and as interested in as I was in finding out stuff. And he was also the person who got me into tapes heavily <laughs> for the first time. Um, because I mean, I had had all these years, you know, by 1977, I'd been a deadhead for 10 or seven years. And I, I think I had like one tape and a, a couple of bootleg albums that I bought outside shows on the East Coast when I still lived there. Um, but I didn't, I never had a dead tape connection just because I didn't know many deadheads. Like my friends in high school didn't like them. <laughs> Most of my friends in college, well, my friends in college liked them, but not to the degree I liked them. Uh, Pretty much. Bam really, Bam became your training ground for, yeah. for how yeah. to how to DIY it yourself. Yeah. On a on a on a side Bam note, six years after Blair left Bam Magazine, I walked into the offices of Bam Magazine and met with the uh, editors Keith Moore and Steve Stolder. Then Keith left, and Steve Stolder took over, and I went on to shoot fifty seven covers for Bam Magazine, over half fifty seven shot most of them a few more pickup photos of jerry garcia and nirvana things like that but i had I had 57 covers for bam magazine from 89 to about 94 or 5 somewhere around there mm-hmm. um so i also have a history of, of working with you folks at bam so uh and, train and, and bam me. was bam was also my connection to sort of meeting some of the grateful dead too i mean the first time i ever met jerry garcia was in i believe it was november 1977 when uh, dennis asked me if i would go with Jim Marshall, uh, who we both knew, um, the photographer over to Front Street to shoot the cover, of, uh, shoot a cover of Jerry Garcia for the December issue of BAM, which was this fantastic part one of a two-part interview by Adam Block, uh, who was a San Francisco writer. It's, one, it's still one of the best best interviews, I think, I Jerry. I have ever seen it. Is that the photograph with Garcia holding yeah, the, the, the glass? Holding the goblet. And, uh, the doc, yeah, right. So that, that was the day I actually met him. And to meet him with Jerry, Jim Marshall was amusing, to say the least, because Jim, right. was, as you know, it's, as we'll also discuss uh, and have you've discussed him on the show. Right. Uh, he, quite, he a quite, a, quite a character. So, you yeah. know, like right. 30 seconds into his, hey, Garcia, got some Coke? You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> two peas in a pod all right so um so bam of course leads to the formation of the golden road but um did you do your book music never stop first yes okay uh, so tell me about that and then yeah. getting into the golden road right well what happened was um yeah the um well while i was uh, at mix actually is when i first got the idea to that i might want to try to put out a magazine. I, I don't know. It, it came at a time I had been reading relics on and off and um, I don't want to say anything too bad about them, but you know, they, I, they were not really filling the bill for me, I felt. And um, 
it was also during that time in the early 80s, they had sort of gone off the Grateful Dead somewhat. I mean, they still covered them a, a lot, but you know, people like Blondie were on the cover and, and they, were, they were sort of, they were trying to branch out, which is, I suppose, admirable in retrospect. Uh, the um, mark in years. Yeah, but, uh, but I felt like um, because I was sort of having better access to the Grateful Dead and all that and was on the West Coast and going to more and more shows in 81 and 82, um, that I decided to uh, first to write a book about them. Uh, and amazingly enough, Delilah Books, uh, Michael Peach, who actually became a pretty big editor in New York, uh, green lighted it. And um, so I did that book called The Music Never Stopped. What year did it come out? It was, it, what? what year did that come out? Music Never it came Stopped? It out in 83. Okay. Yeah. And it was really the first. I guess, cogent history of the Grateful Dead, or it's certainly the, the first biography. book, first biography of the Grateful Dead. I mean, there had been Hank Harrison's The Dead Book, sure. which was kind of strange and right. a, a niche type thing. Um, but I got such a great response to the book. I got really thoughtful mail from all sorts of people uh, that it made me think like, well, I over-researched the book. I, I wrote, I have tons of stuff left over that I researched and I've always kind of wanted to put out a magazine. So. That, that's when uh, we, uh, Regan and I decided to give it a try. And we thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put out some flyers. And uh, some, some of the people who had um, liked the book said, hey, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll hand out flyers for you if you, if you do the book. And so we, we printed up a thousand flyers or something like that and, and sent them to our friends, the Leopold brothers um, back east. And they leafleted at shows. And it was, it was a very simple thing, you know, who are well, who am I? I'm Blair Jackson. I wrote this book, The Music Never Stopped, and what's it going to be? And so it's sort of a kind of funny uh, thing. And we got, and I, and I had committed that if we got enough sub subscribers right off the bat that we would do the magazine, and we did. And what was that number? Just, How many subscribers did you feel like you needed in your head? I don't know. I, I can't remember. Right. Did you guys do any, like, did you do any revenue projections or like? It's <laughs> 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 the worst businessman who's ever lived. I mean, you know. <laughs> So you like never thought, okay, like we now committed to this magazine and we're going to need to spend three thousand dollars or three no. or no. like no. We, we, we we immediately had enough money to print it, and and to research printers people. locally or right yeah, over. Yeah, Anto Printing was our was our printer from the very beginning. Just somebody who I found in Berkeley, uh, Coco by name that's was his name. Yeah, that's the picture in the promo. Is is you right. taking that? And that's Coco who was our printer. Right. And. Uh, and um, no, it was just uh, it was just a lark sort of, and uh, we we always had enough money to print the next issue. It kept growing. Um, we never really, we definitely didn't ever take a salary, but I always paid photographers, you know, fifty bucks a shot. Right. Uh, we paid like five hundred or six hundred for four a issues a year. Is that what you started with? Started at four issues a year, then went to three issues, then annual. I think. And what did it cost for four issues the first year? Do you remember? 10 bucks or something. <laughs> <laughs> and like we, you know, it had, it, it, it had developed a pretty good advertising base too. But we never solicited advertising, particularly other than, you know, one thing that in the issue saying was advertising the golden road, but, uh, I, but we didn't have like a hustling ad director. We probably could have that advertise in it. Like, or, or the yes. well, um, not the great, let's see. Maybe I can't remember. I know, yeah, they know it was various people associated with the Grateful Dead, like uh, Arista, um, right, bought an ad right. for so far, right. and uh, Jerry's uh, art person, the art peddler Nora, she uh -huh. used to buy ads regularly to to uh, hype Jerry's artwork. And of course, yeah. the, psychedelic the psychedelic shop, and, and uh, we are we also have the distinction of being the first place in the United States where Ben and Jerry's advertised. Wow! Before they were when they That's were they amazing. were the nothing, yeah. Very cool. All right, let's jump into some of these covers here. Okay. Um, so first of all, you put out, how many issues total of the Golden Road? 27. The, so final, 20, the final two were annuals for right. 1992. So and 27 issues of the Golden Road, and not one of them had a band member photograph on the cover of the magazine. Every one of them was an original piece of artwork right. that was created for the Golden Road. So the first one we have here, issue one, winter 1984, just, you know, you go through them and you tell me a little bit about each of these covers as much or as little as you want. Well, the, the cover was clip art. <laughs> clip art. It was my design, but uh, not my execution. Regan was always much better at uh, layout and design than I was. Uh, so she would do most of the fine work and, you know, because I'd be cutting things on, a, on an angle and, you know, I'm just not, not good at that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it was just kind of a basic design that we were trying to get to uh, 
um, uh, we wanted in general, I did, I wanted to get away from the, the skeleton design as like the big thing about the Grateful Dead. It doesn't mean that we didn't do skeleton covers because we definitely did a few, but I didn't want it to be the dominant thing <clears throat> because I thought that I had seen just through Grateful Dead t-shirts and art of the, the, that almost anything you could do the right way uh, would have A, a psychedelic component and B, somehow allude to the Grateful Dead. So that's what we were interested in doing. And the Golden Road ended up being such an evocative name that when I would approach different artists about doing stuff, they would, they would you know, it, it, would, it would set them free sort of to do interesting things. And sometimes I would have a specific idea. Like I think the, the next one is, uh, is like uh, number three, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was an idea I had where I, where I went to Dave, Dave Mars, who was one of uh, another artists at Mix. Um, I, I tapped on all these guys for multiple covers um, just because they were, they would usually do layout all day and then they, but they were all artists at night. <laughs> and so I'd say, hey, could you do this? So anyway, in this particular time, this particular one was, I said, I'd love to do a Grateful Dead skeleton rock, Norman Rockwell cover. So that, that's what he came up with. And that's the, that's the direction you created, direction you gave him. I also want to point out that, you know, nowadays for anybody who's watching this, um, if you're doing graphic design and you want to write out the golden road you type in the golden road you have a whole bunch of fonts you pick the font you like and then it is in your layout back then you'd have to pick your font send it off to a typesetter who would make letro set or whatever it was called right and then they the next day you'd get it back or the same day and then you'd cut it out and then you have to actually paste it onto a board and re-photograph that like it was like the dark ages right so yeah. like we used uh, we used typesetters that who were the same people who had been doing mix too so we would go over that would take the, the hard copy over to their house and they would they would type it up in galleys and uh, we would cut the galleys and put the, the galley explain what a galley is a galley is a, is, is a strip of type where it's a uh, like a like a like a section of type in a I newspaper. Just, uh, this would be a, uh, this is this would be a gal. Uh, a, 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 it would come like that, and you'd column. get a column, a column of type, and you would you would come as a long thing, and you would you would cut it up and and, and paste it down on a board. Paste it down, paste it down with wax with brayers, and uh, it was very cool. And sometimes you'd have to cut in a, a, an apostrophe that they'd left out or something, or that we found in the third <laughs> edit on it. Uh, uh, but it was fun. It was really fun. And we did it in our spare time. We both had full-time jobs. I was, I was at Mix Magazine. Regan was at the San Francisco Chronicle uh, as, a, as an editor. And we would come home and, and we would work on the Golden Road with our, with our fun. And so, so this next shot here is uh, one of the pieces of film overlaying the cover that we're talking about or showing here. And uh, you can see some notes from the designer, you know, strip in the, you know, as indicated the black. And so there was like all this film and there was this thing called Ruby lift, which is the right. red stuff that you had to cut out and that blocked out light when you shot different sections of the cover. And then those different colors would be, each get put on a printing plate and they put it through with one color, then put the same piece of paper through again on the next yeah. color and the next color. And yeah. that's, how they, that's how we did this back then in the, in the ancient days of, uh, of, of book and magazine publishing. And that, that was before we did our, any four color uh, separations, like photo right. separations. We, right. we got to that pretty quick, but, uh, right. but yeah, so I have, some of them are incredibly uh, evolved and uh, you know, just have overlay after overlay after overlay. And so I, I really appreciated my artists. They were, they right. were fantastic. Issue 11 with the Southwest design and the cactus, anything? Yeah. There, there's an example of this by Kristen Adams, who was just somebody who approached us and was a fan. And did Deadheads um, write you and say, "Can I do a cover?" Like send you letters? Oh yeah, or... yeah, yeah. Sometimes they'd send us things, and uh, you know, I have a I have a little gallery of ones that we didn't use that are pretty cool, actually. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, everybody had ideas, and uh, so I, I I I don't I can't remember how this one came about, but uh, we you know, it's got that nice Southwestern thing, which we all loved. I mean, we were, we were big fans Santa of the Southwest. Fe, yeah, we'd, we'd been to uh, Santa Fe and saw the Grateful Dead there in 83. And so it was, it was kind of fun to, to get that. Uh, from hey, hey, Regan, poke your head in and say hi for a second because we can hear you over there. This is Regan and yeah. everybody, longtime friend of mine, wife of Blair Jackson and co-founder of The Golden Road. Nice to see you. Thanks for helping out today and, and reminding Blair of things and moving <laughs> the program along on the side there. Um, all right, so this next cover here, Blair, um, uh, is this issue 20, summer of 89. It's like the sun. Who was the artist on this one? And uh, Let's see, which one? Oh, so, that's him. Oh, yeah, that, this is uh, by David Singer. 
Uh, this was the second of two covers he did. I think the other one, I hope the other one comes up. Um, he had done this really great uh, fold out again uh, of him interpreting the golden road. But if that comes up, I'll tell that story. Anyway, this was uh, the second of the two covers that David Singer did for us. And it was, he had said it was inspired by uh, Henri Matisse's cutout period, which was kind of one, one of his later periods. So and those of you guys Matisse, that, the Greek that, that, absolutely sure. Why not? And those of you guys that don't know, David Singer is one of the legendary Bill Graham poster artists. Yeah. More so a little bit after Mouse Kelly and those guys, right? Like yeah, he did like the last year of posters pretty much. And he and a couple other people did from 70, 70 and 71. Uh, I did a little mini documentary on David Singer. You can go on YouTube and look up David Singer. Uh, uh, what is it called? Paper, Ink and Rock and Roll. A uh, little 10 minute documentary. Uh, next cover is issue 22, spring 1990. This is rubber stamp. You'd say. Rubber stamp art by Judith Torn Allen. Well, I think goes by Judith Tornado on Facebook these days. Um, really lovely woman. Uh, she did a co two different covers for us and sent us, she had these great postcards that she would sell of, of sort of Grateful Dead images all done with, with stamps. I just thought it was very gentle and beautiful. And uh, yeah, I just, again, it's not specifically Grateful Dead, but it's definitely Grateful Dead. Issue 21, fall of 89. That is, uh, yeah, that's by uh, uh, Amy Erickson. And I think she's a person who just, uh, no, we, we, that's right. Somebody gave me a birthday card with one of her designs on it. And I thought, Ooh, this would, this, this person could do a nice cover. Um, so uh, I approached her and she was, she was, she was up for it. And, and was did, she a deadhead? Uh, no, I don't think she was a deadhead actually. She, I, she ended up doing a big thing, a poster for the Monterey Bay. Aquarium. Yeah. She did a big, the, their main poster at the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, was done by her later. This um, one I lo really love issue 18 fall of 88 with the hands and the psychedelic. Yes, well, that, that, that actually, it does have a grateful dead appearance on it. Um, the, the upper right hand hand yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, is the hand of Brent Midland. And this is by our friend Quilly Miller. Um, and she like lived right down the street from us and we've known her for years. And she used to come to our stuffing parties too and how sad our cats and things like that. Um, just a great woman. And uh, she, she came up with this idea of doing uh, sort of checking out the vibes or the aura or whatever of different people. So it's like her son is, is one of the, one of the people there and there are various other people, but the one that she got Brent to do it. And then she sort of interpreted uh, her vibe about Brent uh, in the design she chose for that. So it's, it's kind I of put the, keys, the keys on it and stuff like a that. A little, little darkness in there too. So yeah, yeah. Right, summer 1990, somebody named Armstrong with a little Hawaiian blue owl theme here. <laughs> yes, that's uh, Robert Armstrong. Uh, he is the member of the Cheap Suit Serenaders and uh, you know, really good fine musician and, and a great artist. He, he and R. Crumb uh, were friends forever. And actually I originally approached R. Crumb about doing a cover uh, for, the, for the Golden Road. And I got this fantastic card that I treasure uh, that written in his, his yeah. essentially cartoon script, you know, and with a big C that has a shadow on it and all that kind of stuff. And he basically talked about how he hates the Grateful Dead. I've always hated the Grateful Dead. And, you know, you seem like a nice guy and I'm sure it's a good magazine, but, you know, I really hate the Grateful Dead. And, oh my God. and then, I, then I had the temerity later to say, no, I know you didn't want to do a cover, but, you know, now I'm doing a, a Roots thing on, on uh, Dupree's Diamond Blues. And, uh, you know, here's a version by the Grateful Dead. And it seems like, you know, would you, would you think of, would you possibly illustrate this for us uh, for the magazine? And he wrote back, said, I listened to it. It was awful and horrible. I hate the Grateful Dead. <laughs> you know, thanks though. You know, he was very nice about it. Um, but anyway, so um, because I had seen Robert Armstrong, Crumb's friends, designs on a whole bunch of Hawaiian albums that I owned, um, I wanted to, I commissioned him to do a, a cover, which is the cover you're seeing. Um, and were you paying just a few hundred dollars for these commissions? 600 bucks usually yeah uh, okay and uh, yeah and he, i still have the original artwork which is nice uh -huh. um <clears throat> anyway he was uh we were super into hawaii we've we've been into hawaii for years and uh so it was great to kind of get that vibe again not grateful dead but something it, it worked i thought right. and also i asked him then he became the guy i asked to do the illustrations for the dupree's diamond blues story got it and he did it and he did it and he also did a thing for a this uh, humor piece I did on the, the BBC, uh, a, a sort of fake story of the Grateful Dead's history. Uh, did, did them for <laughs> the next that. cover is one of my favorites and I don't know why. This is the summer of 87. It's got, you know, the Garcia album in the lower right <laughs> there. 
um, this, I don't even, you know, who this Pollock, I don't know, like, you know, it's just got this vibe. There's something about it that I love about this. this. Yeah, this, this is another friend of ours named Andrew Warnick, who we've known forever and gone to shows with and all that. And he's a very, very fine artist. And um, we approached him about doing a cover, gave him an open book, essentially an you know, open-ended thing. And he, he came up with five enormous collages. And um, this was just one of the five that he did. And, you know, I, I, I can't remember, it's called From Beggar's Tomb, something, something like that. They all have, you know, Grateful Dead names like that. And this is the one we chose for the cover. And there's another one that he did sort of based around the Skull and Roses cover, which is hanging over here in our living room. Um, and I don't know who owns the other three, but uh, it, was, it was great. It was, it was yeah. kind of a- This is, I'm guessing this uh, is another singer one, this next one, um, Spring of Issues. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's the one. Uh, there it is. Oh, show the show the spread if you can. Yep. Oh, there it is right there. What I was going to say is now all of yep. a sudden you're doing these covers that are wrapping around the back cover. Like on a lot of these issues, there's a full page ad for the psychedelic yep. shop usually, uh, right. probably other things. But now all of a sudden you're doing these pieces of artwork that are like they really like the covers were art, but now they're like these incredible like double page wide horizontal things. I mean, yeah. I can't remember what prompted that, but probably just working with cool artists who wanted to do bigger things. In the right. case of Singer, that was an amazing experience. Um, he uh, he was living not too far from us in Oakland, and I, we Regan and I went and visited his little his little apartment over there. And he had we had talked about doing something on the Golden Road theme, and he, coincidentally, or maybe it's not even coincidental, he was working on a book. Uh, or a, a series of collages about gold or sort of the pursuit of gold, you know, so it's not quite the same thing as the golden road. It was a right, more right. the greed of gold. Um, but anyway, so he had, he had collected all these images. And when I, when I gave him the idea of, you know, can you, can you do something about the golden road? He says, yeah, let me try it. And so we went over there and he was in his socks and we were now in our socks and he had all these incredible images laid out on the floor and um, you know, just random things like all these things you see there, but more. And he would, he would like he, very meticulously. He would just like place one thing over here, then he would place this other thing over there. He changed this thing and changed that thing, and you could sort of see it building. And and uh, every idea he came, every idea he came up with was was good. I mean, everything. Yeah, that's his not style. Is perfect. He this, this collage thing. Yeah. Uh, that, that's his thing. Yeah. Blair, I'm going to zip through the rest of these covers quickly okay. without, because we are already 45 minutes in and now we have so many other things to talk about and I don't right. want to just stick on covers, but again, you know, here's another one that turned out as a double page uh, wraparound cover. Gary uh, Houston. Na Native American vibe. Yeah. Gary Houston, a great Northwest artist. Gary uh, Houston. Gary Houston. Yeah. He's, right. he, he also did the cover for the, Golden Road Anthology book, which was called Going Down the Road, A Grateful Dead Traveling Companion. Yeah, and Gary's an amazing artist. I love his work. Another one, the 1992 Annual, which is a, a two-page wraparound spread. That's it's by Nancy Nimoy, who was, we got her because she had done the cover for uh, Mickey Hart's book about drumming at the Edge of Magic, or whatever it was called. And, and then uh, uh -huh. Scott McDougall, who also was a poster artist, right? Right, Scott uh, McDougall, loved that one. That was, that was, that was actually, another, that was my, des my design. Which, which I certainly could not execute, but I had seen a bunch of Scott's stuff and he does, he does the sort of psychedelic 60s stuff better than right. anybody, any contemporary. And he also, uh, what was cool is later on, we worked together on the Road Trip series. I was sort of co oh, right, semi-co-producer right. of that and he did all, that's right. I know that, all that's that's right. I know of course. And I love how it says onward on top of the bus. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I love this collage, you know, old fashioned uh, postcard, yeah. you know, that was by Dave Mars, who was an, who was a mix artist who did also did the uh, the, the, the fishing it. skeleton and yeah he was he got to just put in a whole bunch of stuff and it, it, this was the design we actually used on the short lived great uh, golden road T shirt so. uh -huh. which is great love it I I love this this we should make postcards of this and give them away um, and then this is completely blew my mind that like randomly here's a back cover of the golden road with two photos on it like just out of the blue like you know. Okay. All right. Here we go. This must be heaven. Memories of my first show. <laughs> so here we go. This is spring of 1990 issue. You've right. already been doing the Golden Road for six years and you decide to write a review of the first time you see the Grateful Dead. Well, it was the 20th uh, anniversary. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Of course. There you go. So it had, it had a, it had a 20th a anniversary of my first show. Right. So this is in January of 70. You saw the show. Or, or was it? March 70. March, March 20th, 1970. 1970. Late show. 
Right. And uh, so briefly tell us about this, this article and this adventure of you going to see your first Grateful Dead concert at the legendary Capitol Theater in Port Chester, <laughs> New York. Well, it wasn't legendary yet. They had just started using it, actually. Right. But now it's legendary. Yeah, by now it's legendary. It became legendary because of shows like this or because of concerts like this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I finally went up there, uh, took the train up from Pelham to Port Chester with my friend Mark Bresnan. And um, we, you know, we were not high. We just went wanted to see the Grateful Dead. We got there and there was, it was, it was like not even half full. It was, it was, it was not even half It was a late show. It was a late show, right? So we were-, we were kind of it started at what time? Midnight? 11? Uh, I don't even recall. Yeah, okay. probably. I don't know. Everything always started late. I mean, anytime it was supposed to start at 11.30, it probably started at midnight. Same with the Fillmore. The Fillmore always ran late. Fillmore right. always ran late. Right. Um, but it was it was just completely mind-blowing. I, at this point, I had only heard Live Dead uh, and Oxamoxo. I hadn't even bought Anthem of the Sun or been curious about the first album or anything like that. And we went there and like literally during the first song, a, a girl near us took off all her clothes and was dancing. There. So, which was amazing for two 16 year old boys uh, to be witnessing. I thought this is, this is, this has potential. This is a good place to be. Um, <laughs> and then, then, then uh, somebody, uh, a naked girl ran on stage and was gently eased off the stage. Um, so it was, it was, it was a wild time. And then you um, saw the same girl no, just, just here, in the audience a few minutes later, right? She was back dancing. Yes, in the audience. Right. Yeah. 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 In our row, no less. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and how old were you? 16. Okay. I don't know. It was just, it was to see it live, even having really absorbed live dead by then. It was just incredible. I mean, you just seeing them there and you, 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 for one thing, you really appreciate Phil more than you can ever appreciate him on on a uh, on an album that the, his importance in the mix and just kind of being able to kind of watch the this this swirl develop in this group and i hadn't heard most of the songs they played that night they did an entire short acoustic set where they did things like friend of the devil and katie may i think and a, you know a couple of a couple of the the acoustic tune they might have even done black peter at that point i can't remember um but you know like they did a they did a titanic version of viololi blues which i had no idea what that was because i hadn't heard the first album and it's it sounded like the end of the universe it was just the loudest coolest full on feedback and everything oh yeah just the whole thing and and I then know. you know there's like a 25 minute love love light and which you know the pig pen probably told me personally to get my hands out of my pockets i don't know maybe maybe not <laughs> um but it was just, uh, it was it was it was completely transformative and transformative enough that i immediately then got tickets to, for when they played the Fillmore. Then I mean, uh, yeah, Fillmore East the next time uh, in May, and uh, again in September. And uh, you know, it, it just kept building from there. And by the by seventy one, I was then starting to go to two shows in a run, pretty reliably, like at the Capitol Theater. Um, so I was just going to ask you. So did you see some of those legendary seventy one shows where they broke out all those songs yeah. for the first time? Oh yeah, I was at two of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. What they break out like uh, for the Bertha, first Bertha playing in the band, uh, Bird Song, Wharf Rat, right. yeah, just just lots and lots of stuff. And yeah. what, what's what's interesting from my perspective is that really for like the first three years that I went and saw the Grateful Dead, really all all the way through seventy four, almost every time I'd see them. I would have no idea what they were going to play. They always played things I'd never heard before. I mean, they, they really made a point of before each tour learning new stuff or trying out new stuff. And they were always playing unreleased things. Well, yeah. So at this show, that you must be, this first show in the acoustic set, they played Uncle John's band. And I'm guessing yeah. that those records weren't out yet. Oh, of course not. No. Working, working as Inter American Beauty haven't come out yet, right? Yeah, no, right. So I mean, even them just being unplugged, I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, so, uh, Black Peter, they did play acoustic, so they're playing these songs that are going to come out on records like really soon. Right, right. Um, and but so, anyway, they, they, you know, you it, it was immediately a thing where you trusted them. You knew they were going to deliver, and you didn't care what they played. Uh, you know, I didn't care what they played probably until I started the Golden Road, to be honest. You know, because I never really followed set lists or oh shit, they played Black Peter again. You know, I mean, I was not like that at all right. for, forever uh, until people sort of brought it to my attention. So basically, you're saying you were never jaded until until you had to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. No, I was appreciative. Uh, all right. I've seen a couple of, uh, you know, I found an old letter that I wrote about 
uh, from uh, uh, describing this 1974 Winterland show that I went to, that I went to, and uh, you know I made some comment, you know, as well, you know, the shows I've been to recently haven't been as good as the ones I saw in '72 or '71 or so. So oh, I don't, I guess yeah. I guess I had my criticisms here and there, but in my memory, uh, it's it's like every show was great and right. I loved it and had a fantastic time. I went to a lot of shows alone too, which was which was I was always kind of enjoyed. Um, uh, I didn't really get into the social aspect of it really until the BAM days when a bunch of BAM people would, would sometimes go. Right. Sometimes you, you, were a, you were a critic before you became Blair Jackson. Yes. Fox yes. journalist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So this next photo here is a section called Deadline. It's a photo that I took of Jerry Garcia, Rob Wasserman and Edie Brickell. Um, I obviously did a lot of work with Blair and Regan on the Golden Road. What was the Deadline section? Deadline section was basically news and rumors. We tried to not print rumors. We tried to get the real news, and we we got uh, we had pretty good access to uh, Cameron later, and uh, you know uh, various people in the dead organization. They would tell us what was going on, and what what we could print and what we couldn't print. You know, I'd say, well, you know, they're saying this is going to happen. Uh, you know, in J July, is that going to happen? It says it might, but don't print it yet. So we would we would, we, would, we were always respectful of that. Um, and they probably appreciated that. Yeah, they did. I mean, this is all again in the days before the internet, or most of it was through the days before the internet. So, it did the the rumor mill was not quite what it what it became later, and and it wasn't as fast as it was. So, people appreciated getting the information, and we you know we would always have the hotline numbers in there so that people could get the the, the absolute skinny about everything. Um, but you know, the deadline became the place where we talked about solo releases that they were doing, or Mickey Hart has a new book coming out, or Bob Weir has done this Panther Dream, you know, book with a children's book. Um, and I would uh, I would often just call people up and say, give me a quote or two about this. I'd call up John Barlow and say, uh, hey, you've got introduced these new songs. Are you willing to talk about what? Uh, Gentlemen, start your engines is about, or uh, you know that kind of thing. And people were. Um, People like the Golden Road. I mean, the the band liked the Golden Road. I, I don't want to overstate it, but they they definitely embraced it almost immediately. Um, in fact, Jerry Jerry once uh, when Regan and I went up to interview him for a, what turned out to be a mostly aborted interview in 1985, he you know the first thing he says is you know we appreciate it, <laughs> um, and he was kind of effusive about how much he liked the magazine. Nice. Um, so so I, I had sort of constant access to people and uh, and was always curious about almost every aspect of the scene. So, so we would dip into all, all sorts of different things. Right. Well, the other thing you have to remember is that most mainstream media didn't really care about the Grateful Dead. No, especially not in the eighties. Right. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't so touch of gray happened that anybody in the mainstream, you know, and that was a short lived thing, but in general, um, you know, I know that, that the, the band had a love hate relationship with relics because Les Capel, the original founder of Relics, you know, was not always so kind with the band. And, and, uh, um, and so I think there was a different vibe with you guys. I mean, I think eventually uh, the band came to like Relics for what it was because it wasn't just about them and, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Right. And so yeah. um, uh, and I could see how, you know, West Coast versus East Coast and they connected with you and they were they, they liked what you were writing and, and they they saw that it was reaching, you know, the fans. Um, let's talk about the roots section. Um, I got this first shot up here with this guy named Roy Hamilton. And then there's the, the Dolly Parton, you know, tomorrow is forever. Uh, here's Elizabeth Cotton. Tell me what the roots section was and when did that start and why did you do it? And what was your idea behind it? Well, that started with the very first issue, uh, which, which had a really long root section in it. Um, I was just one of those people who was always curious about where things came from. I mean, the Grateful Dead by that point had turned me on to so many things that I had never heard of. I mean, I when I saw them play Sing Me Back Home in 1971 at the Yale Bowl, I had never heard that song. I had never heard Nora Haggard's version. I'd never heard El Paso before I heard the Grateful Dead uh, do it. You know, I, would, I grew up in the suburbs of New York. I never heard any country music at all. So really my education uh, uh, in country music came a lot from investigating the people who the Grateful Dead covered. So I would say, oh, well, let's, let's, let's see what Merle Haggard is all about. So I'd buy a Merle Haggard album or, you know, all these old blues tunes. Um, and so, you, you mentioned to me that you would sometimes call these people up. Did you ever try and call Merle Haggard up and ask him about it or? I did not call him about, no, I'd never called Merle Haggard about that. Some of the other people that you would call well, up. I did, I did in that first issue, uh, I, I called uh, Elizabeth Cotton at home in, near Buffalo, New York. And she was there preparing dinner for her 
children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. <laughs> and I uh, asked her about Oh Babe, It Ain't No Lie. And she told the story of, of how she wrote that song. And, you know, and that was it. And, or another one, a, a great one that we had in the first issue was I tracked down Bonnie Dobson, who had written Bo Morning Dew. I'd always wondered about that song. And um, I guess because I had been working for Mix for a while, and I, I was kind of in the the know about uh, BMI and ASCAP and other song publishing people, I would go through them and say, hey, will you give me Bonnie Dobson's uh, address so I can write her? And they say, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, what so, did, so tell what, me what, what was Bonnie's, what did Bonnie tell you about Morning Dew? I'm, I know we know it's about nuclear holocaust. What did Bonnie say? Yeah, she, she, she told the entire story of uh, being at a party and uh, <clears throat> there being a big discussion about nuclear holocaust and it being partly inspired by the movie On the Beach, which was a sort of last man and woman on earth film that had come, had come out. And so it's, a, it's basically a conversation between two survivors of, of the world killing holocaust, uh, um, nuclear holocaust. And um, so she talked about that and how she wrote the song and playing it for a friend over the phone. And then she, she mentioned how, uh, uh, I guess it was, who was it? There was some writer who uh, was the first person to say, walk me out in the morning dew, which was not hers, her lyric. And uh, then later Tim Rose uh, got co-songwriting credit for, for doing walk me out in the morning dew. And that was right, a bone of contention because she lost half of her royalties to this guy who really didn't have any right, input right. into the song. And did you ask her what she thought of the Grateful Dead's version or? Yeah, she said she always liked it. And she said, but she said she was too shy when they had come to Toronto in 1967, where she was living then, she was from Canada, um, to, to go backstage or anything. And they didn't play Morning Dew at the show she went to. And she was, she always regretted that, that she didn't do that. When I, when I wrote to her and I uh, presume now too, she, she was living in London, England. So yeah, right. it was, it was great. And I was, so that was, that was the great thrill for me is to, track people down when I did something on Ico Ico. I, I, I called up Sugar Boy Crawford, who's the guy who actually uh, wrote the song, the original Giacomo, okay. and I just found him. You know, just, these people are, were out there saying, and they weren't right. they were hard to find. And most of them had never been asked about any of this stuff. Right. Okay. And for that one, that, for that one too, the, uh, the Ico, I talked to the, you know, Art Neville and the Neville brothers about their version. And uh, uh -huh. so, yeah, it was, it was, it was fun for me. So I assumed it would be fun for other people. And I think, I think it was. So here is a, a fake ad. <laughs> President and Mrs. Reagan and the Council for a Clean Living urge you to see the most important of cinema event of all time. The Grateful Dead, the band from hell. <laughs> this is a full page in your magazine. Yeah. Like, uh, like, like what's got like just two pages, the spread. Yeah. It's the center spread. Oh, it's right. It's okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's just like, but you have to turn the magazine sideways to, to look at it. Right. It's just full on spoof just to have fun. Yeah. I mean, we, we did these almost every issue had some sort of a spoof in it. We, we invented fake news before it was famous. <laughs> <laughs> And that was kind of a fun one, uh, just because uh, we had to, we tried to find uh, we had to have people people actors and such portraying the band members. So we came up with like Francis Ford Coppola as Jerry Garcia and uh, Leonard Nimoy as Mickey Hart. It's perfect and, you know, because he really does look like Spock. I know, I know, I know. I think that's maybe where they got the idea to do that later in a skit, uh, a New Year's skit. Yeah. Um, but we were always doing things like that. Uh, we had an MTV. I want my GD TV where, where I took a, a photo. Uh, I don't have it handy, but a photo of uh, Lucy and Fred and Ethel and Ricky out on the golf links. And I changed Fred's head to Jerry's head and uh, then wrote a fake TV show that, it, you know, they go into the golf. Link. I know it was, it was fun. It was, it was, it was, it was. And, and, then, and here's another one at last, the historic dead CDs you've been waiting for. Fallops, bleeps and blunders, volume one through 33. I mean, like, like and then at the bottom it's another Leopold Bildman scam. Tell us who the tell us who the uh, who Bernie Bildman was and who the Leopolds are um, and why this exists. Well, why they exist is a better question. Um, no, Bernie uh, Bernie is a famous Birmingham uh, Alabama dentist who has been sort of hooked oral surgeon who is uh, he's retired now who is hooked into the Grateful Dead scene forever and just one of the pluckiest joie de vivre guys with this fantastic southern accent he actually went to uh uh egypt with them if you've ever seen the uh, the footage of the guy putting the flag up on top of the pole that was him right isn't that right or he was there yes, at any he, was rate. Related. he was related maybe he took the photos yeah 
anyway, so he's, you know, he's sort of been connected forever. And he's a guy that we just met somewhere along the way. And through Leopold. Was it through John? Okay. Through yeah. Leopold. Right. And and who, uh, who are the Leopold twins that I know? For the Leopold them. identical twins. And like I said, they were the ones who helped leaflet uh, uh, the Golden Road very early on. So they. John Leopold and Dave Leopold. John, yep. Dave, John and Dave. And John is now a county supervisor in. Um, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. So we haven't been able to sync his career yet um, <laughs> with stories. But we could. Um, and Dave is has he has had a really fantastic career as a putting on art exhibits. He was a, he was a curator for the Al Her Al Hirschfeld uh, estate, and, um, and fairly well. He did the curation at the fairly yeah. That's well, right. He curated the fairly um, well in um, in at Soldier Field. The Soldier Field, right? Their exhibit there. So um, I, I don't know. There was there's a long story about why their heads appear in there, but it, it involves them giving me embarrassing items during set breaks at shows like at Frost, uh, obscene gifts to humiliate me when I was high. Um, so I, this <laughs> so was my. Getting, so you're getting back at them essentially. I'm getting back at them by having them be right. the, the scammers. But, uh, uh, and, and of course, there was many many feature articles, individual interviews. So here's Robert Hunter, Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience by Mary Eisenhart. Um, so this has a byline by Mary Eisenhart. Uh, usually if you guys wrote something, it usually didn't even have your name uh, on it because it said everything written by Blair or Regan except when noted. Uh, Mary Eisenhart was a BAM Magazine cohort, cohort of yours, correct? Yes, and also she ran Micro Times, which was another BAM Magazine Mr. extended from, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and so we get, we would get uh, her own bylines <clears throat> on things too, like she did uh, this illustration here of Hunter. Oh yeah, that's uh, by William Cohn, who was an artist at the San Francisco Chronicle where Regan worked, and uh, we were constantly either using their people or plundering their photo files to to find uh, historic things. And um, um, also, we used we used the Chronicle. Um, I would I would go into those that, that photo archive to um, for to get funny pictures for the humorous ads we would create to, right. for back issues and things like that. Mm. So that was fun. But um, yeah, and William Cohn it went on to be an artist at Pixar, and he designed one of his first big projects was uh, designing the stuff for Cars for mm. that for right. that film. Oh, nice, nice. He's and, a great, um, a great and, what, and did we learn anything particular about Robert Hunter in this interview here that? No, well, he, he was not interviewed that often. So yeah, there, there's plenty. I can't think of anything right offhand, but uh, right. It, the, Mary, uh, you know, Mary has a kind of a literary bent. So it was, it was, it was excellent to have her talking to him. I didn't get to talk to him. Uh, for uh, here's, years. A, here's a portrait I did of Hunter in, in uh, 80, 88, I think. Right. Um, and then uh, we want Phil, an interview for 1890. Um, how was Phil to interview? Tell me about Phil working with I was I was nervous. <clears throat> I was nervous about talking to Phil. I don't know. He was always somewhat scary to me. I'm not sure why, um, but uh, he ended up being great. We, we did it at uh, Front Street and he, he was, it was while he was in the midst of working and on and choosing the material for uh, Without a Net. So that would be 1990, I guess. Um, fall of 90, maybe. Um, oh no, I guess I did it in April. I, I can't. Did you? Anyway. Um, when but, you yeah, he was, he was cool. He was one of those people that, uh, that occasionally come by who said, I want to read this before it's in, in, in print. Uh, in fact, he was the only band member who ever did that after the initial first interview I did with Mickey. Oh. Um, and he changed a few things, you know, there are things only in his own things where he wasn't uh, happy with how he had put something. So I, I actually appreciate that when, when, when a subject does that or cares enough to say, well, that's not really clear what I really meant was. So you uh, sent him the article before it was published? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, there is one, there is one story of, uh, <clears throat> of the Golden Road that, that was... Um, it was one story that was banned by Garcia, and I still have it. I'll, I'll, I'll have to post it online because there's no reason not to. Right. Uh, I, in 1985, I, because of my contacts at Mix Magazine, I was able to be in the audio and video truck for when they were recording things for what became so far and the beginnings of what would have been in the dark. Is that the uh, stuff they put out for in Civic? Yeah, Marin Civic. So I was in there and I wrote an entire day about being in, in the truck and, you know, what went on, what went on inside and all that kind of stuff. And Len Delamico, who was the guy who would let me into the truck, the video director, uh, said, well, I, I have to show this to Jerry because, uh, you know, he, he would he wouldn't it was supposed to be private. And and sure enough, Jerry said, no, this is this is too intimate. I don't I don't I don't want this in the magazine. So uh, interesting. All right, easy come, easy go. Um, and then we get to Donna, um, the greatest story never told. This is 
This is from 85, issue six. And um, this was a, a fantastic experience. She, I, I had actually first approached the Grateful Dead about interviewing Keith and Donna with BAM back in like 77 or something like that. Uh, they, they had had such a bad experience being interviewed for the Grateful Dead movie when they were tripping uh, back in 1974 that they basically had turned down all interviews ever since. And their footage never appeared in the film because they were too high. Wow. <laughs> Um, so, but by, by this time, uh, you know, she had been out of the band for a long time. And, um, so I approached her and was delighted to learn that she was lived in Petaluma. So I drove up to her house and took a few photos, like the lead photo is mine. Um, and she had really never told the story before to anybody. Uh, and so that, that, that really, that was, that was one of my, my great coups. I thought I was getting the Donna story. Right. Uh, I have a few photos in here that I, I took in uh, November of 78. Here's Garcia and Donna. Here's Bobby and Donna. These were, I think, at my third or fourth Grateful Dead concert. Uh, Bobby, Donna, Jerry with Billy in the background. Um, and then one last color shot. Um, I do want to remind everybody that if you have questions for Blair, you could submit them on any of the Facebook feeds where we are watching the show today or on YouTube. Um, we have an intern out there gathering your questions for Blair and, and or Regan or myself. Uh, so please uh, send in any questions that you would like to ask. Um, okay, so now we get to um, this darkness has got to give in the spring of 1990. Um, obviously this is written by you because there's no byline or you and Regan. Um, I'm guessing these are some photos that, that Regan stole out of the Chronicle archives. I don't think so, actually. Those are mostly blotter acid and- oh, the, uh, One of the police? Oh, oh that. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't recall. I don't recall where they came. Anyway, that's a collage you made. So how did the band feel about you writing about things getting bad? They were all for it. In fact, um, you know, that's that's when I was really getting to know Cameron Sears well, and he really wanted to get the word out. I mean, you know, they they were resorting to putting out flyers from the band uh, that would then be spread uh, around uh, of them sort of begging people. If you don't have a ticket, don't come to the show. It was getting really, really bad in Post right. Touch of Grey. And so, you know, nobody likes their dirty laundry aired, but they, they all knew it was all for a good cause if we could sort of expose it. And, and you know, I think in there, Cameron is, might even, I can't remember if it's this one or another one, is actually, you know, reinforcing a lot of the things that, please don't come to a show if you don't have a ticket, don't hang out in the parking lot, don't do nitrous at parking lots, all, you know, all the kind of stuff that was really dragging down the Grateful Dead. They were being banned left and right. Right, um, and that's a problem because if they can't play anywhere, they can't make yeah. money. They can't Interesting make thing money. about th that particular story is it was reprinted in Harper's Magazine of all places. Interesting. And then I, I threw one of my photos in here of a, a poor deadhead soul being arrested by the UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. California police at a, at a show at, at uh, right near the venue. Mm -hmm. um, one afternoon long ago, a previously unpublished interview with Jerry Garcia. Um, how does that even exist? Like, why is there an interview from 1967 that does that had never been published? How did you get your hands on it? And um and it's being published in 1985. And there's a huge gap between what they did in 67 and who they were and what they were in 1985. Um, you know, reading this article, those eight years later, what was revealed that like kind of took you by surprise, if you remember? Well, I mean, I don't, I can't remember how it came to me, but I guess one or, or the other of the authors had seen the golden road and said, Hey, I've got a tape of this interview. And they literally brought me the tape and I transcribed it. <laughs> so it was that funky. Uh, and it had not been, been seen before. And, um, almost the entire interview was there, but it's not all of it. I can't remember if they included the thing about the monkeys. You know, there, there's a question at one point they asked a question about, you know, what do you, how do you feel about the monkeys? <laughs> it's 1967 says, well, how am I supposed to feel about the monkeys? Which is very, very Jerry, you know, you know, as if he knows that they're asking it. So he'll say something like, Oh, the monkeys suck or, or something. But uh, anyway, he seems like the same Jerry, you know, that I interviewed in 81 and many times sub subsequently. Um, He's very smart. Uh, there was some of the interesting background in the interview is that at one point somebody says, oh, they, they found our equipment van. Their, their equipment van had been stolen like the previous night or something and it had turned up somewhere else in San Francisco. So it has that kind of real kind of small band on the run type uh, thing. 
uh, happening. And uh, he, was, he was very thoughtful. I love this Herb Green photo where Ro Rosie McGee's in the middle and it's got Laird Grant, the original Rosie, yeah. Rifkin yeah. and Scully down front. It's like a real family affair. Time out with Bill Graham. The other thing I want to point out here, here for, for some strange reason, you decided to give Blair and Regan a credit and you just write by Blair and Regan. And the thing about the Golden Road is that it was just like this casual conversation, right? It was really great journalism, okay? But it also was just this casual conversation between you and the thing you loved and deadheads, right? So, you know, talk about Bill Graham by Blair and Regan. How, how does Bill fit into this whole scene and, um, and what was it like interviewing Bill about the Grateful Dead? Well, I, I had previously interviewed him with Dennis Erickson for BAM, a two, a two issue interview back in 1977, again, with the irascible Jim Marshall kibitzing and say, ah, oh, that's not true, fucking Graham. <laughs> uh, he was always amusing to have on, a, on a, an interview. Um, anyway, but uh, so, yeah, we approached him about it and um, I wasn't too surprised that, that, he, that he immediately accepted. And so he had us come up to Masada. Um, well, he, he also knew me. I had written a, a review of The Last Waltz for the Bay Guardian, San Francisco Bay Guardian. I was their main music critic for like a year and a half or something. And um, he had liked it enough that it was framed and in, in the Bill Graham offices. So he knew me through that too and through the, through the BAM interview. Um, but anyway, he had us up there and he was just incredibly soulful. And uh, we talked to him for three hours that first day about you know everything about the Grateful Dead and uh, very revelatory about sort of, he was very, very wise about them too. You know, he had a very interesting notion about, you know, how the Grateful Dead are sort of, uh, how they make Whitey dance is, is what, is, is what <laughs> is that, which is an interesting thing. And, and it's a thing that Jerry has talked about, it's sort of about, about gravity and how, you know, you dance to the Grateful Dead a certain way because of the, the way you hear them and all that. Anyway, so he was, he was kind of smart about the music and told interesting stories about it. And then like a week later, he said, you know, I didn't get, I didn't finish. So will you come by the office? So, so she and I, Regan and I went by his office down on uh, Fifth, Fifth Street, right near, the right near the Chronicle where Regan was working. And, you know, he talked for another an hour and a half because he wanted to talk about all the charitable things they'd done. And, uh, and you know, he was, you know, when he'd get involved and he'd go all the way. He was, he was, he was such a great presence. And, uh, you know, obviously those of us who live in the Bay Area uh, just have so much affection for him for the way he put on shows and, you know, that when I started going to really a ton of shows was in the early 80s because we'd get three Greeks and two Frosts and, you know, he'd do Ventura. Um, we'd do uh, and okay. Cal Expo, Oakland Auditorium. Uh, just, you know, we could. it wasn't hard to go to 30 shows a year if you went to every show in the Bay, in, just in the Bay Area, Northern California, Cal Expo. Right. Um, and they were always staged with such uh, love and knowledge of the deadheads and, and, you know, fun, fanciful things, you know. We're going to go back into that a little bit later on this. I've got a whole other section where I want you to talk about that because I have some photos to go along with it. So let's keep going here. Uh, who was Cowboy Neil in a, in a Ken Kesey interview? Um, you know, obviously these guys are not in the Grateful Dead, but they're so important to the Grateful Dead story. Right. Um, Neil Cassidy had been dead for many years by the time he uh, did the story. You asked Steve Silberman to write it. Steve, of course, has gone on to become David Crosby's biographer, written a great book, New York Times bestseller about autism, um, uh, Allen Ginsberg's biographer. But wasn't this one of the first things that Steve ever wrote? Uh, yes. It was the first thing he wrote for us. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what his I career think, was. I, I think yeah. that's true. It's how we sort of... Be, it, I think he mentioned that to me the other day. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we had... We were given the task of editing a guy who doesn't need editing, who has this <laughs> incredibly unique and individualistic style. And you know, I think at first it was like, "Whoa, what, what's going on here?" But uh, he's uh, he's one of the great writers who who has dipped into this scene, in my opinion. He's he's, yeah. he's great. he only did a few things for the Golden Road, but they were all great. So, uh -huh. and then uh, um, I got some photo yeah. photos of Keezy here on the bus. There's his uh, son Zane videotaping him up top there. This is the, the further reincarnated further bus that was out and about in the in the 80s and the 90s. And um, uh, who did the Kesey interview? Was that, um, well, that, that, was, that was that was Regan and me again? What happened there was uh, after we got the word that Ventura wasn't going to happen in 1986 because Jerry had nearly died. That was quite a phone call to get from Steve Marcus. Um, 
we said, well, let's go on a road trip. Let's go up to Oregon. And, and um, I've been sending Kesey issues and I don't think I'd ever spoken to him actually on the phone or anything, but I said, oh, can I come up and interview you and that kind of thing? He said, yeah, sure, what the hell? And so we drove up there and we went to Crater Lake one day and we were, went to Eugene and hung around there. And uh, so we went out to his house, to the farm one day, and uh, it was it was quite a scene, I'll tell you. I mean, you know, we didn't know what, what to expect uh, just because we didn't know anything about it uh, or how he operates. So we were just kind of tagged around with him for an entire day thinking, are we actually going to do an interview? Is this actually going to happen? But, you know, we fed the cows with him. We went, he took yeah. us on a walk and we saw further rusting in the, in the, in the fields. And, um, you know, he let us take pictures. He and Zane were hanging out in the thunder machine and demonstrating that. So and I was recording everything as we went. And then, you know, finally after and he, like- And he served us dinner. He served us dinner, that's right. And uh, Faye did, yeah. And after like seven hours there, he says, let's go upstairs and talk. And so we go up uh, on the, under a full moon up onto the roof of the barn. And, um, and we talked for like, you know, maybe 45 minutes before he got nervous about, oh, why am I doing an interview or something? Uh, but got some great stuff. And it was, it was, it was you talk to him about, one of the more memorable nights of my life, actually. Did you talk, did you talk to him about Garcia's coma and, and that? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That was, yeah, that yeah. was all right. All right. All so, so this next section that we're going to get into here is Jay Blakesburg gets introduced to Blair Jackson. I do this series of photographs of the Greek theater in Berkeley of deadheads. And we didn't really know each other. No. Um, and, uh, but I think that we obviously had people in common and I think I just cold called you and, uh, or maybe mailed them to you or said somehow somebody saw these and you thought it'd be a great idea to, um, uh, present these photographs of a bunch of deadheads at the Greek theater in Berkeley. Um, there's, I, I believe there's no text that accompanied this or was there? Was no, it just, that's, no, that's it. Just the spread, right? Regan did a thing uh, either before or after that called the joys of hall dancing in which he interviewed a whole bunch of people about that kind of ecstatic dancing, which is a really cool article. But uh, as I recall, you are not involved. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I was, but um, I, you know, I still to this day love these photographs. And I do like to talk about the fact that, um, you know, when we look at these photographs and now, you know, this is all 80, 86 in our mind, 86 was yesterday, but in reality it's, you know, 34 years ago. Amazing. And uh, as you, I'm flipping through a bunch of these photos here. And as you're looking at these photos, um, you know, the thing that becomes so incredibly unique about them is that there is no technology. Nobody's got a cell phone. Nobody's dancing. So there'll be a clip on Instagram, which would just be a science fiction fantasy at that time anyway, just like all of our, you know, tricorders that are in our hands are a science fiction fantasy. Um, none of that existed back then. And so I was very, very, um, I was thrilled that you published these photos gave it the two page spread. Um, you know, my name was in print in the golden road that I was reading and I loved. And so um, I want to thank you for bringing me into the golden road family. And, and, and I, at that point, you know, we needed you, we needed you. Well, thank you, Blair and Regan. I appreciate that. Can I just uh, say something? Yeah. I just want to say that, uh, you know, pretty soon after cell phones came in and I would go to concerts, like especially ones that my kids, uh, took me to or that we took our kids to the killers or you know some band like that snow patrol um i was so bummed at the the phone whole phone thing i and i kept saying jerry would have hated this jerry would not have liked to have a sea of phones in his face while he's playing maybe i'm wrong maybe he would have gotten used to it completely. I, I, I think you're right i think <laughs> that you know it, 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 i mean if those if those phones had shown up at the very end of his career yeah they, like the cell phone became you know very common in 93 or four. And then all of a sudden everybody was like that, you know, he'd walk out on stage and there'd be 10,000 people holding their camera, their phone up. It was, you know, I mean like it fairly well when I did that big, uh, uh, the shot that's the cover of my book for the fairly well book yeah. the band is facing backwards and I'm about Billy's drum riser. You know, there literally is 70,000 people out in the audience yeah. you know, with their cell phones up. And, and so, you know, cool. it, I mean, I've gotten used to it, obviously. Well, it's a different time. But anyway, but back then <laughs> it was this very pure organic thing. And we were not dancing to be on social media. We were dancing to be in that moment. You know, we were being here now. Right. And having those profound experiences. And, and I think that those, you know, those photographs that I took, you know, hopefully captured some of that, you know, profound moments of bliss and joy and the energy that happened at shows when people were raging and dancing. Um, losing Brent Midland in 1990, very sad. You asked John Perry Barlow to write an article. Um, thoughts on, on that? 
Uh, yeah, it was, it was a shock. Um, it was on our, right after our wedding anniversary, we, we came out of the, the place we were staying in uh, Marin County and got the news on the radio. It was, it was, it was shocking to say the least. Um, so yeah, I didn't really have any relationship with, with, with Barlow. I mean, I had talked to him a couple of times on the phone about different songs and all that, but I, I thought like he was the guy to write it since he had been Brent's closest collaborator and kind of closest friend really in the whole Grateful Dead scene. And, and what, he, what he writes here in the very beginning is that Blair Jackson asked me to write something about Brent's death for the Golden Road. To say anything beyond the obvious will require the emotional equivalent of public nudity, but I signed on to do it, or I agreed to do it rather. Um, so yeah, I mean, he had you know reservations about it, but of course he stepped up for his brother and he wrote this you know incredible moving uh, piece about Brent. Um, which again is just part of the history. He uh, he ended up actually being a person who was always very honest uh, towards the end of the Grateful Dead about how things were really were. You know, he was not sugarcoating stuff, and he was uh, he was kind of horrified by some of the roads that certain members took uh, in the Grateful Dead and the scene, and was always very uh, candid about it. And uh, I think that made him a bit of an outsider to some in the dead, but, uh, but uh, I always appreciated that, that he had that kind of uh, honesty about it. And this shot that I have up here now is of Brent playing keyboards. And I want to point out that this photograph was taken on August 16th, which is today, August 16th, 2020. This photograph was taken on August 16th, 1980 by me in Edwardsville, <laughs> Illinois. So this photo of Brent, um, uh, we can all bow down to Brent for a second, is exactly 40 years ago today, um, mm -hmm. Edwardsville, Illinois. Um, I'm gonna post some of these photos from the show later on on social media after we're done here. So um, the video clip, Touch of Gray. So first of all, I wanna point out that um, for a first in the Golden Road, uh, Blair Jackson spelled gray wrong um, in the caption. It is actually, the song is actually Touch of Gray, G-R-E-Y, but he- The British spelling. He did the British spelling of G-R-A-Y. That's okay, we forgive you, we are all human. Um, were you at the filming of this? Were you down in Monterey for this? We were definitely in Monterey um, and we elected not to go to the shooting. Uh, after the long show, we were really looking forward to partying in our rooms with our friends. And so we went back and did that rather than freezing in the, in the cold. And uh, I have no regrets about it. It was a great party and it turned into a great video. So, right. And, and, of course, great show. right. and of course, it didn't matter because your friend Jay Blakesburg was there to photograph it. Exactly. And it still ended up in the Golden Road. I love this shot here. I'm showing up Garcia. Uh, with the, um, you know, the, the slate in front of him. Right. Uh, Billy, of course, as the skeleton with the skeleton behind him. Jerry, awesome. the skeleton. Jerry giving the thumbs up, which you used on that fake CD that you made for the, <laughs> the built-in uh, Leopold um, thing. Um, I love the shot of Jerry where he's like, whoa. Um, so, you know, for me, we had heard that they were going to be making this, doing the filming. And we just walked up to the front gate. And we're like, are you guys really going to open the gates up and let people in? And they're like, yeah. And as a matter of fact, we're doing it right now. And we all ran up to the front, me and like six or eight or 10 of my friends and, and my wife, who was just my girlfriend at the time. Um, actually, technically, I don't think we were together yet. It was just before we got together. Um, her and all, and my girlfriend at the time, and all these people went right to the middle on the rail because they all said, we want to be in the video. And I said, I'm going to move over to the left a little bit because it's a better angle to take pictures of them while they're making the video. And of course, I am the only one that actually makes it into the video. Um, <laughs> I think I'm at the two minute and 20 second point i'm bopping my head it's one of the points where they're doing playback of the song and they're doing audience shots and of course i have my 1987 mullet uh, <laughs> so you can't miss me there i'm the guy with the mullet and the nikon and uh bopping my head but you know it was incredible to watch them here's a shot of phil giving a fuck you with his middle finger to the microphone because as you can see they removed all of the xlr cables and so none of the microphones had cables and they weren't like wireless. And so it was obvious that they were just mics that they were just singing into with no cables. It was kind of funny. Uh, and then this last shot here is actually a big wide shot during the day of Laguna Seca. Um, and here is the slate for, um, uh, again, where they were, you know, having a little mini slate for Gary Gutierrez. 
Um, here we are with a fun stuff section. What was fun stuff in the Golden Road? Yeah, the odds and ends thing uh, would be humorous things, uh, embarrassing photos of the band. It would be Grateful Dead film and TV sightings where somebody would say, hey, there's a corpse of a guy in a plane in this episode of so-and-so and he's wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt. So we would go get a, a shot of that. Uh, it was uh, Strangest, of places. Strangest of Places, which was... Uh, things where the burrito shop is called Scarlet Begonias or something. So, you know, people would, would send those in from all over the country. And it was, it was odds and ends. It was, you know, where like the Village Voice ran an article about uh, like there was this psycho, psycho guy named Lyndon LaRouche, who some people probably know. He was this psychotic right wing guy. And he went down on the Grateful Dead. He just hated them. And so we would run quotes from that. And uh, uh, you know, I, I love this one on this page. It's the Midas muffler shot. It says Midas well, Midas well. You know exactly right. Kind of and sense. of course, on this particular one is the lead photo of them, uh, which is them making the uh, video for uh, throwing stones. Right. And uh, we had heard, I had heard uh, that they were going to be making a, a, a another MTV MTV video because we're in the MTV age and they were going to be doing it in an abandoned high school in Oakland, California. And I happened to live across the street from an abandoned high school in Oakland, California. And then on the day that I heard the rumor that it was going to happen, I just walked across the street with my camera and pretended that I was supposed to be there and spent the entire day on set, and these are the photos I'm flipping through now, um, just shooting the band hanging out in these weird oil coats and Jerry with his top hat and, uh, you know, these crazy costumes. And a lot of people don't know that Bill Kreutzmann was not there that day. Um, there was a rumor that he was in court for something that day. So Robbie Taylor. Billy, no. Yes. Yeah. Bobby was not in. Billy was not there the day they filmed it. He's in the video because they did some like fake live stuff in a black right. background studio. Uh, but then, of course, that's where I got my famous shot of Jerry holding up the sign that says Happy New Year that has been bootlegged a million times into Happy Birthday, Happy Easter, Happy Passover, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Christmas, um, you know, so on and so forth. The most bootlegged photo of Jerry Garcia ever. <laughs> uh, but I just love some of my shots here. I got the shot where, you know, the, the, the film, the, the DP is shooting the band and you see the grips and the gaffers and the, you know, the dolly with the camera and they're walking by and. Of course, they're just watching them set up and, and just, you know, weird, weird scenes inside the gold mine. With, uh, with all due respect to uh, you and to Len Delamico, the Grateful Dead should never have put on those costumes. You know, I, there's something yeah. about the Grateful Dead and costumes that didn't work. I you know, did, I, them on I, New Year's shows I, and they, they dress, dress Jerry up as Santa. They do all these different things. And it was never quite right. They just never quite ever looked natural. They, 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 yeah. they had trouble with it, I think. I was a fly on the wall. I had no influence over what no, they were no, doing. No. And of course, here's the shot where they drew this big menacing piece of graffiti, you know, with the, the guy with the barbed wire and, you know, proletariat, cool. proletariat gray. And, you know, of course, <laughs> the lyrics of throwing stones, the apocalyptic. This particular shot here, the guy right in front wearing the mask, that's Robbie Taylor filling in for, for Bill <laughs> uh, And then I just love this, like Bobby is, is lip syncing something. And then there's like all these other crew people off to the side. It's a close up, so they're not in the shot, but just a real like production still kind of photograph uh, Bobby with the, you know, the slate in front of him. And um, you know, just, just for me, it was really fun to be on the set the entire day. The photos were better than the video. In my yeah. And I hey, wasn't Jay, the most Jay, how did you, how did you get Jerry to do that thing of holding the happy birthday? Uh, I mean, I mean, had the happy new year. Happy new year. So one of the guys on the film crew actually handed that to Jerry and said, Hey, I want to make this my Christmas card or my holiday card. Will you do it? And I just happened to be standing right next to it. So I got the shot also. And years later, that guy found me on Facebook and sent me a photo of him sitting next to Jerry that his buddy took. So it's a picture of him and his, you know, Jer the guy and Jerry, Jerry holding up the thing. But my photos are just of Jerry holding up the thing, you know, right. it all, all happened in like 15 seconds, you know, we're, we're, we're <laughs> done, you know, um, here's the JGB article. Um, this is a, a, a feature length uh, story that you did on the members of the Jerry Garcia band, but you didn't interview Jerry and you asked me to go do portraits of each individual band member. So I did John Kahn and I did Melvin out by a church in Hunters Point Bayview where he lived. Uh, I went down to L.A. and shot David Kemper, who was the drummer at the time. And then I shot Jackie and Gloria, both at Lake Merritt, right near your house in right. Oakland. Um, tell me about this particular story and, and, the, and the Jerry Garcia band. Well, I had I had actually done my done an interview with Gloria, Jackie and Melvin 
pretty early on, like maybe in the first year or something, um, which I did at Melvin's house um, in, in San Francisco. And so by the time that I know the, the, the Jerry band would really started to get super popular in the early nineties. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I didn't want to do another history of the Jerry band story. And so instead I just called up each of them and asked them a few questions about, you know, what's your favorite song to play? You know, do you think uh, that the band's new direction has taken a more spiritual turn since Jerry's illness? So, you know, I just asked them a few bullet point type things and they were all super nice about it. And then your photography definitely is what brought it all together. I, I love those photos. Yeah. yeah. Um, here is a feature story that you did on the 20th anniversary. It's got a bunch of Jim Marshall photos uh, from the 60s, Mountain Girl, Pigpen and Janice. Uh, what's the story here? What's this 20? Well, the, <clears throat> for the four issues during the 20th anniversary year, I divided it into five year periods and then tracked down photographers who had things from each of those periods. So that gave me an, ex an excuse to write to run even more Jim Marshall photos. I've gotten to know Jim through BAM. I uh, knew him pretty well by this time. And uh, working with Jim Marshall, I mean, I've made fun of him, you know, constantly and talked about how he pulled a gun on me one day, which he did. Um, but <laughs> he also gave me the thrill of allowing me to actually go through his proof sheets and find stuff I wanted. Because normally if you'd ask Jim, hey, do you have a shot of, of you know, Janice and the Grateful Dead or something like that. It, it was like one shot that he had circled on his proof sheets. And that was the one he sort of sent out to magazines or, you know, he had these shots that, that are the iconic Jim Marshall shots that you've all seen of her backstage, Janice backstage with the, the Southern Comfort bottle and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, he was, Jim was nice enough for $50 a shot, no less, to allow me to come over to his house constantly and go through the proof sheets. So I got to go through with a loop looking at all his shots of the Grateful Dead in Monterey or all the shots of the Grateful Dead at Woodstock. Or here they are backstage at the closing of the Fillmore West in 71. And anything I liked, he would send out to a print to, to have printed for, for us. Um, so he was just in this incredibly generous thing. And, and I got to tell you, like almost every shot he ever took on any proof sheet is publishable. I mean, he, he was the greatest photographer I've ever been associated with. He right. just never took a bad shot. They were just, and, 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 and of course, full disclosure, I work for the Jim Marshall estate. I do all the editing now. So I've looked at all those proof sheets and you're absolutely right. As Jim would circle one shot, he'd make a print of that and you'd never see the roll of film again until somebody like you went back and dug in and dug these other, you know, these incredible treasures out that nobody had ever seen. And so- um, was, They did that book called Proofs, right? Wasn't it called Proofs? Yep, called Pro Where, uh, Proofs. Because it was just an entire book of just full proof sheets. So you really can see how great, uh, you know, all his shots were. Just yeah, so, so it, it was the proof sheet with the hero shot circled and then the hero yeah. shot on the other page. Um, interesting story. So you were long gone from BAM Magazine and I was working with BAM and when Bill Graham died, Steve Stolder, the editor that I work with, went over to Jim's house and did what you did. He looked through all the proof sheets, picked out a whole bunch of shots. They drank a bottle of whiskey while they were there, which is pretty typical of Jim. I never did that with him. In a day. And Jim did pull a gun on me once because he was mad at me for something and kicked me out of his house and told me he was going to shoot me. Uh, but anyway, so Steve Stolder spends an entire day at his house, picks out all these photos for this cover story on Bill Graham in 1991. And then Marshall calls him like a day or two later and he goes, Stolder. Why don't you come over to look at the proof sheets? We got to pick pictures out for the Bill Graham issue. Completely <laughs> did not even remember that it ever had even happened because he has completely blacked out from, you know, snorting mountains of cocaine and, and, uh, and of course, uh, drinking, you know, bottle, hundred dollar bottles of whiskey. Um, and then what is this, uh, what was this uh, film or West farewell? Was this just like a little pictorial with a couple of paragraphs of text? Again, Jim Marshall photos. Yeah. That was a, that was a thing I did in a lot of issues where I, you know, I was one Flashback. of the what flashback is what you call flashback. It. Yeah, there were things where the, on the 20th or whatever anniversary of the human being, I would get, assemble photos of that. This was the Fillmore West, and uh, I did a, a few of those. And it was again a, an excuse to dig up some cool photos from uh, photographers. All right, uh, you did an interview with Bill Kreutzman. It looks like it has no byline, so it's either by you or Regan no. or both. Um, how was Billy to interview? Billy was great. It was, uh, I was, that was another one I was a little nervous about because Billy's reputation preceded him in the sense that he could be a wild man on the road and this and that. And he hadn't really done many interviews or any that I was aware of uh, at that point. And so, uh, so the first, the first time we went, we, I can't remember where we did the first one, maybe up at the office or something. And I got home 
and started transcribing and realized that the entire back half of the interview that the, the, uh, the tape recorder had not worked. And so I had to call up Bill Kreutzman and said, Billy, I, I hate to break this to you, but the entire second half of the interview did not work. He said, oh, no problem. He said, I'll pick you up uh, at the office tomorrow and we'll go driving around. So that's what we did. We went driving, he was, I think he was in a Jeep or something. And we went driving around Marin and Sonoma County and he was just talking very free and easy and cool. He was, he was, he was super nice. nice. And you use one of my photos in the article, also taken at the Touch of Grey video shoot. Um, here is Deadline again, and uh, you did a uh, you ran a portrait of Bob Weir in the summer of '92. It's a portrait I did of Bob up of his house in Marin, and uh, I just threw these in here because I wanted to point out that these were shot on a four by five camera, which is you know on a tripod with a big cloth over your head, and uh, it was shot on Polaroid film. Uh, it was a special film not made anymore called Type 55 that also gave you a negative. So here's the Polaroid, and then that's the print from the negative, a Polaroid, and then that's the print from the negative. Um, just another deadline piece. Uh, here we are at the Bill Graham Memorial Concert. This was just in the back section of the magazine, or the middle section, whatever. Um, also want to point out, this is a color photo. I think this might be the first color photo that we're seeing in the magazine. What year did you introduce color into the magazine? Do you remember? Um, it must have been that year. Oh boy, because this is the ninety-two. Was was it the Hunter Garcia spread? Was the first color thing? Oh, we did? That, that was in ninety-one. Ninety-one. So all right. So just the last couple of years, you had color. yeah, the last couple of years, and I can't and, remember and why. Really what it, what it was is there would be like maybe eight or twelve or sixteen pages in the middle of the magazine that would just be the color stuff, and then it would go back to the to the wood free paper, the non glossy paper that was just in black and white, you know, it'd be like a little section in the middle that you would. Uh, is that true? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, true. yeah. Yeah. And a lot, the ones that I looked at all the ones, it would just be like, it wasn't, it wasn't sprinkled out throughout the magazine. It was usually all bundled together in one, in one block, all the color pages. Huh. Yeah. Okay. I'll take it. But me. anyway, so, uh, it, you know, in particular, um, so here's a shot of that same shot of Garcia that's in the magazine, which was taken at the Bill Graham Memorial concert. Uh, which was in Golden Gate Park at the Polo Fields. Here's Neil Young uh, uh, playing with the band when they did the, the rousing rendition of Forever Young. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there's this quote, pull quote in this article that says, ironically, Graham's memorial concert was the biggest concert BGP ever put on in Northern California, drawing more than 300,000 people. And that brings me up to where you were starting to talk about this before, and I asked you to save it, which is talking about the Barsotti brothers, um, Peter and Bob Barsotti, and, and their relationship to Bill Graham and what they did. And so this particular photo here is of Peter Barsotti and his, and his wife, uh, Bedecky, and sadly, both of them are deceased. Uh, Bedecky died in a car accident and Peter died of cancer. And uh, this next one is a Peter, and that's his brother down there on the lower left, Bob Barsotti. And this is a picture of Bob getting ready to lead one of the Bardi Gras parades through the audience at uh, one of the Bill shows. Um, what I want you to talk to me about um, is your, what you thought about, because these guys, Bob and Peter, were the sort of the masterminds of right. putting these spectacles together, whether it was a Chinese New Year parade. Uh, right now, I've got a picture of a dragon dancing on the lip of the stage right. by himself with Garcia up on the stage by himself just doing space. And so I want you to compare and contrast that to like, you know, on the East Coast, right? When you'd see a Grateful Dead concert, you didn't see a dragon dancing on stage with Garcia doing space. You didn't see a parade with giant Mardi Gras heads going on. This was truly a unique Bill Graham Presents thing. And you started to go into this and I stopped you because I wanted you to talk about this now, about how, you know, we have this really unique opportunity on the West Coast as deadheads to experience these really, really special moments with the Grateful Dead. And I think the Grateful Dead were sort of going along with the ride that Bob and Peter Barsotti were sort of setting up for them, right? Um, Going on, on for the ride and being billed for it. <laughs> and, uh, but it was worth every penny of it. You know? Of, of <laughs> course they should. So, so just give me your impressions of, you know, Mardi Gras. I've got the big head up here now and Chinese New Year and regular New Year and how these things really became iconic uh, on the West Coast and because of Bob and Peter and Bill Graham presents. Well, of course, it, it goes all the way back to Winterland, or actually, it probably even goes back before that. I think, I believe on 
on New Year's Eve in 1966 when the Grateful Dead played, I believe somebody like came, rode through the Fillmore on a horse, a live horse. I think that actually happened. It did happen. I've seen pictures. Yeah. Anyway, I just, you know, New Year's became this thing and it became Bill's chance uh, to sort of shine because he would play Father Time. And so, you know, there are all those great Winterland photos of him like in a giant joint sailing over the crowd and, and uh, uh, or in the, uh, on a motorcycle one year. So he was always trying to top himself. And, you know, by the time the Golden Road was coming out, um, you know, he was, he was, they were, they would get, get even more elaborate. I remember in 82, actually that's before the Golden Road, you know, they had this giant mushroom that rose from the, the, the downstairs at the Oakland Auditorium, rose up to the top and uh, he rode in on that. Um, but um, yeah, the Barsodis were sort of egging him on uh, as he started as they started to play more and more celebratory shows. You know, they they would <clears throat> they they would in the Bay Area they would play. Um, you know, there was one stretch in '86, I think it was, where they it fell shows fell on Mardi Gras, Chinese New Year's, and Valentine's Day in succession in the same week. And they would they would decorate the Oakland Auditorium later, the Kaiser Center, with different things each time. And that was all uh, Peter Peter and Bob sort of working with a coterie of deadhead artisans. Freddie Hahn was was probably the main one who, and they would they would consult and they had a budget, I guess, uh, and they would just get more and more elaborate. I mean, some of these New Year's and and uh, especially the. Uh, Mardi Gras things, these parades of these giant things going through the crowd. And it was, it was, it was always a nightmare, you know, sort of doing the logistics of it, of having to create pathways on the floors. The floor is already completely packed. And yet this, these huge things are going to have to come through the floor and somehow uh, through brute force and, and people being squashed uh, so that they were bug eyed, um, they, they managed to do it. And, and I think it was more, I was more like Moses parting the Red Sea. Yes. Yes. Like, right. That's really what, like these guys were like living gods, you know, but yeah. it was, it was, but the deadheads love it. You're tripping and you're watching these giant, giant heads. <laughs> like you said, Freddie Hahn was one of the artists. Um, yeah. He enlisted a friend of mine, a guy named Zim and Zim built a lot of these big heads with Freddie um, I've got a shot coming up here of the dragon floating, like the member the blue floating dragon up in the sky. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it, you know it's it's this one right here, slide one fifty five, Regan, if you're trying to find it. And uh, my friend Zim built that one, you know, and it, instead of the dragon just being on the ground like it typically was, which was the hog farm people like weaving through, you know, this dragon was floating in in space. And so, um, but didn't you just didn't you? You never tired of that, right? You always felt like it was, no, no. to me, I, had, uh, like I looked forward to that every year so much. I had one uh, fun uh, personal episode too, which was, uh, I had, uh, they, in 1985 uh, at the Oakland Coliseum, they had done this giant, because it was the 25th anniversary, is that right? Yeah. Uh, they had this giant cake with giant heads of the band on the cake. And I hated it. Th I thought, this is, this is crazy. It was that so was yeah, oversized. It was crazy. I mean, I, I'm sure it was fantastic, but in my state at that moment, I thought, what are they doing? Anyway, so I, I sort of wrote about it that way in the Golden Road. And then when Mardi Gras came around the next year, Bob Barsotti, uh, or Peter Barsotti actually, came up and says, uh, all right, wise guy, you're going to be the head, of, you're going to be a head in the Mardi Gras parade. And so I had to, <laughs> I had to like leave the show during the middle of the first set and go backstage. And they, they put this giant head. They, it was, it was the heads from, from new year's that they had remade for Mardi Gras. So they had completely redecorated the heads so that they had like patches and pirate patches, like Mardi Gras things. And I ended up being the head of Jerry Garcia in the Mardi Gras parade with this thing that was like 60 pounds. It was so heavy and it was, it, it was connected to a pole and we had to dance through the audience and uh, it was, it was great suffering. I'll tell you, it was, it was, uh, yeah, they got you back because Peter and Bob are pretty much, you know, they're right up there as being merry pranksters. So yeah. Uh, well, they pranked me good on that. Well, one. I'm, hoping, was, I'm hoping that Bob Barsotti uh, will join me as a guest on photos with stories uh, in October to talk more about some of the stuff that he's done with Bill Graham. Uh, he has a long history with Bill Graham presents starting, I think as a teenager. Um, the shot that I have up here right now is Bill Graham. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Bill Clinton, smoking a joint yes. with a saxophone, which was a Mardi Gras float that my friend Zim, I think was involved with. And I just think this is so classic, you know, um, you know, they got, as they moved it from the Oakland auditorium into the, 
uh, Oakland or uh, uh, Coliseum. These parades got bigger and they got grander. This next shot is a float going by with a bunch of hippies on it, including a topless woman. I put this in here so you'd have a flashback to the naked woman at the Capitol Theater in Portugal <laughs> when you were a, a young lad of 16. Not to uh, mention the girls at the Greek in 81. Yeah. And so, um, you know, truly a, just a remarkable time in Grateful Dead history. Uh, here we are, another deadline, which is the acoustic uh, and electric shows that they did at the Lunt Fontaine in in uh, New York City. I think you maybe reviewed, didn't they do a West Coast version of these shows also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this shot is mine, and this one is from Taken in New York, uh, specifically on Halloween. I went to just the Halloween show, um, and uh, here's a shot I took of Bill Graham outside dressed up as a Mad Max type character. That's Herbie Green's photo of Garcia conjuring up the guitar out of the, the top hat in the background there. And this shot here, I love from Halloween. This is the Ghostbusters that all dressed up as <laughs> instead of Ghostbusters. Um, and then here they are with the acoustic set with Jerry, David Nelson, John Kahn, uh, Sandy Rothman. Who is the violin player? Kenny Kosek. And, and then who's the, the percussionist? Was that Kemper? Yeah. Yeah. Kemper. David, David Kemper. Kemper, who was in the Jerry Garcia band. And then, and then, and then, of course, here's the electric version of that with Jackie and, and Gloria and Melvin and Khan and David on drums. Uh, and then of them, you know, with the smog coming up, the dry ice smoke and the skeleton on the stage for Halloween. Uh, tell me about this particular interview in 1988, 10, 28, 88. Uh, again, no byline. So this is by you and Regan. And I think there's a, a great line in here. Um, if I can... If I can, if I can read it um, without my right glasses, um, it says, uh, "You guys, you guys went up to to the Grateful Dead warehouse, and Regan says, what's that? I think this one was at the office. At the office. I'm sorry, the Grateful Dead office. Um, uh, let's see here, Chronicle, Make Believe." Uh, uh, Regan says, some, uh, and the stamp, the postage stamps had just come out, right? Or the, with Jerry's face on them for some country and like. It was like, like no, it, it was actually a fake postage stamp that someone proposed. Yeah, got it. And then. A and, and, a picture and, of it. And, and, and Regan says, um, yeah, you never know where you're going to, your face is going to turn up. And then Jerry says, it's bad enough to turn up on my head every morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's Garcia's comeback to, to, to Regan, you know, just like. So, so, so talk so to so me about like hanging out with Garcia and what he was like when you were talking to him as human to human, like that kind of stuff, the self-deprecating stuff. Like, you know, what was, tell me about what Jerry thought of the golden road, what he thought about being interviewed, what he wanted to talk about, what made him comfortable? Because you knew what made him comfortable when you interviewed him. And you knew what lines or what roads not to go down. Talk to me about hanging out with Garcia. And, and, and your I'd, already, I'd already interviewed him a few times by this point. I mean, uh, David Gans and I interviewed him twice in 1981 for BAM, um, which are really great interviews. Those went really well. Um, and then Regan and I first tried to interview him in 1985, right, as the Golden Road was beginning. And unfortunately for us, as when we arrived at, at his house, he had like laryngitis and he was like really stuffed up. So we couldn't do the interview. And so we, we got him to like, let's talk to us for like, let's talk for 15 or 20 minutes about video and film and stuff like that. Yeah, I'll take him. Anyway, and, and there's a funny uh, thing where <laughs> we were sort of across the room from him. And uh, when, when we sort of started the would-be interview part, I, I said, do you want us to move a little closer? So, and, and he said, I can see if, I, I can hear you fine. Do I have to look at you too? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, that was the time that he said, we appreciate you and, uh, you know, they like the golden road and all that kind of stuff. So he was, he was, he was pretty accessible to me. And I mean, I interviewed him a few times at, in 1987, I interviewed him sort of about the whole touch of gray thing and the, about the video and making all that stuff. And uh, I, I talked to him with Paul Grushkin when Paul Grushkin's Art of Rock book came out, uh, Garcia at the behest of, of Mr. Grushkin, the late great, um, uh, did an interview just kind of looking through the book, looking at posters. Oh yeah, I remember that. Oh look, there's my phone number in this ad for the off stage, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh -huh. it, was, it was kind of a warm, fun thing. Uh -huh. And he was always up for that thing. And I, I think the last interview I ended up doing with him was only about pig pen and uh, for the big uh, pig pen retrospective I, I did in the final issue, uh, issue 27, which is definitely one of the things I'm most proud of. Um, and uh, he was happy to talk about pig pen. It, it, it right. was, you know, and we talked for like an hour or something just about right. pig pen. So okay. he, was, he was very, you know, he liked, he liked that, I guess he liked that we didn't 
just ask him like all the same questions that everybody asks him. Like in this particular interview that you're talking about, the one that you have the photo in, you know, I, I my approach for, in that one was to talk about how you experience the show. So what are you doing before the show? You know, what are you thinking about during the first set? When you hear this song, is it is it is it is it suggesting that you play in a different key? You know, it was it was it was kind of about that type of thing instead of you know what how about these crazy deadheads or you know what about drugs you know? right. although we did talk about drugs in that right. or what about the hate ashbury tell me about yeah. something, you know tell like, me about the hate like, like what, what a pedestrian journalist for like a major media outlet might ask him that doesn't i can't them. blame them i mean you know they've got they've got a job to do and an audience to feed so right. yeah you know, and like you said, a different audience. This is a portrait that I did of him at the Touch and at the Throwing Stones video. Rather, I'm going to speed things up a little bit because we're almost at two hours here, and we still want to get some questions. Here's another deadline with Bob Weir and Garth Hudson, which was um, specifically at a Mill Valley Film Festival um, show that Rob Wasserman's wife, uh, ex-wife manager, put together. Claire, and it was tr a tribute to Hal Wilner, which is this shot here on the left. It's Hal Wilner famous record producer died last year. That's Sid Straw, an independent artist, Bobby, Rob Wasserman, and of course, Don Was. And Bob, of course, plays with Don Was now in Wolf Brothers. So you guys, you can see Don and Bob have known each other for, you know, 30 years, you know, more than 30 years. This is taken in, in, in I think, 89 or 90, this is photo was taken. So this is 30 years ago. Um, Don Was and Bob Weir were in each other's orbit. They played a little acoustic set that night. Um, Bob and Rob, they, uh, you did an interview with Bob Weir and you used one of my photos of the portraits I did of Bob and Rob when they first started doing Weir Wasserman. I have a bunch of shots in here, Bobby in this suit and tie. He loved that suit. Um, <laughs> and then of course, uh, this particular shot here, the close up of Bob with his hand under it. Uh, that's the lead photo in this particular article. Or article For some reason, I didn't shoot that page, so it's not in here. Uh, then we get to the Hunter Garcia interview. Um, so, of course, this is a legendary photo shoot for me. It was three minutes long. You called me up, I think, either in the very beginning of, of January or the end of December and said you were doing it and asked if I would do the photos for it. And I was thrilled to death to be one on one face to face doing an official portrait of Jerry Garcia and, of course, Robert Hunter to boot. Um, it's color in the magazine. Tell me a little bit about this particular article and um, what it meant to you, because I believe this is the only time Garcia and Hunter were ever interviewed together. And I can't wait to actually go back and reread this article because I'm going to do this uh, later today. Well, it was, dare I be a cliche, but it was a thrill of a lifetime. I mean, two of my heroes and uh, the way they played off each other was, was, was beautiful. I mean, they, they had this rapport and they just, I just asked them about individual songs and they, they would, it would come, you know, different things would come to them and they'd kind of wrap back and forth and, uh, you know, so there's a little tiny little dialogue about Althea and, 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 and Jerry says, oh, she's like a spirit of something or, you know, I, I can't remember many of the specifics, but it was, it was just great. And they, they bounced off each other so, so nicely. And, and uh, then, you know, at the, however many hour and a half mark or something, uh, we got the word, you know, which would sometimes come from their publicists saying, okay, you're done. And it's like, oh, really? Okay. And uh, so you were, I think, in the, in the next room and said, okay, you, you, get, you got five minutes or something. Or he didn't even say how long it was, but he just said, you know, he didn't, you didn't get much time. One of my great regrets is that I didn't get a picture with, of me with the two of them. I was I would have done that. shy, shy like about taking uh, sh shots with people. I always thought it was an imposition. Yeah. So I didn't really ever do that with anybody. Yeah. And I would have loved <laughs> Now to I regret it. it. Yeah, I would have loved to have gotten a picture of you with these guys. But yeah, uh, I took, I think, about 10 frames in black and white, and they said, you're done. I think actually <laughs> Pat Parrish might have even been the one who came in and said, you're done. And uh and I was like, wait, what? I was like, I thought I was going to get 20 minutes with these guys, you know, and, and I just started blowing off film as fast as I could. I had my Hasselblad with me. I didn't even take one picture with it because that's like, shoot, crank, shoot, crank, you know. So I just stepped on the motor drive and I think I shot a roll and a half of black and white and a half a roll of color. And, you know, still ended up with, you know, perhaps my most iconic portrait of Jerry and Hunter as well. And of course, when we lost Hunter, you know, uh, not too long ago, uh, Everybody in the band, you know, on their Instagram feeds, use my photo of Garcia and Hunter to, you know, mention that passing of, of, of Hunter. And they did a special Hunter show, Dead & Co. did at Madison Square Garden. They used my photos up on the big video screens. And, um, you know, very, very, very sad, obviously, but I'm sure legendary for you and, and happy that that exists. And I can't wait to go back and read it. I'm going to keep going here. Here's a picture of Brent and his daughter from the Throwing Stones video that you used in a roundup. 
We have an interview with Vince. Uh, real quick, tell me about Vince. How was he for an interview? Vince was great. He was he was fun, fun and funny. He was he was a very amusing guy. I, I got to interview him sort of right as he was coming into the band uh, for the first time, and uh, he was still very naive and kind of starry eyed. You know that he'd fallen into this amazing thing. I got to know him uh, pretty well after Jerry died. Uh, I interviewed him extensively for my Garcia book. Went up to his house a couple of times, and uh, we actually became. You know, I I would like make song suggestions for Missing Man Formation, which was a band he was in after Jerry died that I thought was really, really good with Steve Kimmock. And they were really the first of the post Grateful Dead bands that I really liked a lot. Um, anyway, he was, a, he was a gentle, nice guy. And I didn't know how troubled he was, but obviously he was troubled um, to later take his life, uh, try it once and not succeed and then try it again and succeed. Right. Uh, so it's, a, it's another sad chapter and I also, I, I liked what he added to the band uh, more than a lot of people. I know some people are, are eternally critical about him. Okay, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I like him. I have I a couple him. portraits here that I was showing of him that I took actually post Jerry in 96. And uh, there's a couple of kind of goofy, silly portraits that he was doing. So he, I could see that sense of humor that you're talking about. Um, this is another, I think deadline area is what this is. And this is a, uh, uh, the in concert against AIDS and this particular shot with Bill Graham and John Fogarty. Uh, John came out and played Creedence Clearwater songs for the first time in decades because of a lawsuit he had with uh, Sal Zanz who owned Fantasy Records and owned all the copyrights, all the Creedence songs and the band that Fogarty put together to debut, the, debut these um, Creedence songs for the first time was Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir on guitar, Steve Jordan on drums, who's John Mayer's drummer and a famous record producer and drummer, Keith Richards he's played with, and Randy Jackson from American Idol and Journey on bass. And here's some photographs from that particular show. It was very loose, a lot of people hanging out backstage. Garcia had a lot of fun playing those uh, Korean songs. And you can see them all on YouTube. I have to be completely honest and say I was super disappointed by the set that they played with uh, Creedence because there is not one second of Garcia jamming. And they played them like note for note covers with no jamming at all. But it is Garcia playing lead on some of those songs. Barely. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted them to Grateful Dead Eyes, John Fogarty is what I right. Which would have been great. So here's, Mickey, here's Mickey backstage with the Celtics jacket and uh, shot from that particular night. Uh, Hunter playing with Garcia band on the East Coast in 1980. Some shots that I took when I was about 18 years old. Um, this particular night was the night of my mother's 40th birthday party, a big catered affair. And it was literally five minutes away at like some banquet hall that my father rented um, where the Garcia band was playing uh, with uh, at King College. And I went to the dinner early and I looked at my parents and they said, see you later, go to see the Jerry Garcia band. And I left and went off to the show. Um, what, and, what a terrible son you are. Yeah, that's okay. Um, years, years later, they used all my photos from the show when they released it as an official release after midnight from King College. And even the program was, they used all that. That was mine. I gave it to the Rhino Records to put all that stuff together. And I showed that to my father. I said, do you remember where you were on, you know, 22880? I think that was the date. And he's thinking, he goes, that was the birthday party for Joan on her 40th birthday. And I'm like, uh huh. Do you remember where I went? He's like, yeah, you left for some concert. I'm like, well, now it's a CD and I have all the pictures in it. <laughs> and they paid me a lot of money. It's like, okay, you're forgiven. Um, anyway, so uh, another deadline. This was a backstage at the Weir Gallery, uh, a Jerry Garcia art show. There was a whole bunch of journalists there. I think one, me and one other photographer, maybe from the Chronicle. And uh, you were there for this, right, Blair? When, when, yes. uh, and that Jerry was just having a conversation with us about his artwork. And I was oh. able to get his attention for a couple of kind of portraits where he was looking at me. Uh, but he was really just talking to all of us about his art. And I'm sure he's so he was, clean. Yeah, throwing out questions. Uh, Here's some shots of Jerry from 93. I'm just zipping through them because uh, we got to go because I want to get questions in. It's almost at the two hour mark. Um, this is a great story that you asked me to go and photograph, which is an interview with Steve Marcus, the head of the Grateful Dead ticket office at the time. And uh, I asked Marcus if he would lay out all these envelopes and all of these tickets on the ground. And he did. And so you can see all these incredible, we all know about the Grateful Dead um, uh, ticket request envelopes. And they just had a bunch of the best ones hanging out in the office and they laid them all out on the floor. And I did these photographs and uh, here's Blair, Regan and David Gans on New Year's Eve in 1987. 
and I threw a bunch of shots. I wanted Blair to talk about his impressions of New Year's Eve, but we're not going to do that because we're kind of out of time. It was fun. Father Time up on the giant Golden Gate Bridge at midnight in 1987. Touch of Grey, we will survive. Um, um, oh, I don't know what happened here, but I added in some books and they're not in here now. They didn't get saved. Um, Blair has put out three books. And I think really briefly you wanted to talk about your books. I'm sorry, I don't have the book covers here. I thought that I put them into the more, more than three, actually. Okay, so, uh, so talk to me about Garcia's life, the book behind you, Grateful Dead Gear. Um, uh, tell me about your books. And then briefly tell me about these golden roads that you have in your garage that you can go to this website, rockoutbooks.com, and you can order these copies as a benefit for the Rex Foundation. Um, talk to me about your books real quick and let's wrap things yeah. up and get a couple questions. All right. Um, well, the, 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 the Golden Road was essentially the springboard to my entire post Garcia writing career, uh, which has included several books, most notably uh, Garcia and American Life, the biography I did of him in 19, I think it was published in 1999, um, for which I interviewed as many people as I could. It was really uh, it's one of the great experiences of my life was researching and writing that. Um, later, I did a thing uh, called Grateful Dead Gear, which you see there, which was uh, sort of the tech book. It was about uh, Grateful Dead instruments, recording sessions, and live sound systems. And I had that kind of expertise, such as it is, um, from having worked at Mix Magazine for, for years and having seen a lot of recording and knowing a bit about live sound. I'm, I'm definitely not a super tech person, but I knew enough to be able to write this book. And uh, a lot of people seem to have appreciated it. Uh, and then my most recent opus is uh, with David Gans uh, called This Is All a Dream We Dreamed, um, which came out in 2015. Uh, and that's an oral history of the Grateful Dead that, that uh, he and I put together, which is which was also a lot of fun. Um, so, and then- in, in, It's just been reprinted. And it's just been reprinted. Congratulations. And, uh, there have been, in between, there are like a zillion liner notes. I've done a zillion liner notes for all sorts of Grateful Dead and Garcia releases. I helped put out some of the early Garcia releases after he died. You did a blog on dead.net for a while. A blog for two years on dead.net uh, called uh, Blair's Golden Road Blog. And um, I don't know, it's sort of, it's, it's the writing never stops. It never stops. And I'd like to just say that I really look at Blair and I look at Blair also with David Gans and Gary Lambert as really the, the, the true historians of this band, of this story. Um, you know, I know Dennis McNally has written stuff about them, but these guys um, never worked for the band per se when they were the band and they were, they, they reviewed them and they, interviewed them and they approached them as deadheads and critical journalists and the history that these guys have written Blair, David, Gary in books, magazines, blogs, etc., really, really shows the true, true history of this band, the, you know, the band beyond description. And so I want to thank you for all that you've done for the deadheads, because it truly is a remarkable body of work that you have created in your life and you should be very proud of it. Um, because you put a lot of time and energy into it. And um, uh, it was fun. It's, it's that, all been fun. And it's been fun. So, and as Garcia always said, we're in it for the fun, right? Yeah, exactly. Did any, did any say something like that? So, uh, Will, do we have any questions for Blair? Yeah, we do. All right, let's get started. Uh, we have one from Jim here. Throughout your journalist history, what was the toughest article you ever wrote? Wow, toughest article I ever wrote. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Kesey article was was sort of one of the most involved ones, the day on the farm, just because it was assembling so much stuff and involved history and current stuff and it was hard to piece stuff together. Um, beyond Grateful Dead stuff, I, 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 I couldn't begin to, to suggest what was the hardest. I mean, there some interviews are easier than others, you know, and you get, you have rapport with some people more than others. Uh, fortunately, you know, Garcia was such an easy interview because he loved to talk and always had opinions about everything and would get on like a hundred different tangents that you would never expect, you know, about some book. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. So, uh, some book that he had read. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I can't really think of a particularly hard thing All right. to write. Next question. Uh, I know you touched on this earlier, but um, let's talk about like the biggest inspirations behind starting the publication, The Golden Road, Sarah L. asks. Well, just kind of being at Grateful Dead shows was the greatest inspiration. And 
you know, hanging out in the parking lot or walking from the parking lot to the hotel and seeing the, 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 the people selling wares. You know, we, we always thought of the Golden Road sort of as our contribution to the Grateful Dead scene in the same way that somebody would make a Grateful Dead tie dye. And, you know, we, not, we got to know some of those people in the 80s, especially in California, where you'd have uh, Red Bear designs and different uh, spectrum batiks and all these people selling at every show. And you'd see them at every show. And it was like, uh, OK, well, the great the Golden Road is what we're doing. And that would, that's our contribution to the scene. It seemed like, you know, when we started, it was a time when it was really kind of blossoming and blossoming in so many ways. When I remember when we went up to Eugene in 83 and went to the Holt Center shows, which was really one of our first road trips outside of Ventura. Um, you know, there was almost nobody there. I mean, there were, you know, a few people selling t-shirts and, and uh, it just grew and grew and grew. And we loved that. We thought it was great until it got to be too big, of course. Right. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it was just our contribution to the, to the scene and giving our expertise, which was in writing. What do you mean by it got too big? What happened? Well, in the late 80s, <laughs> especially after Garcia almost died in 86 and they came back in 87, the scene just completely changed. It got so large that there would be as many, almost as many people outside of shows, especially on the East Coast and no, in California too, uh, as there were inside the shows. And they were people who weren't necessarily even trying to get into the shows. They were just people who wanted to see the colorful scene and, you know, maybe drive by drugs, maybe buy cool t-shirts, maybe, you know, just, it became- also, a, There was a lot more scammers. There were a lot of people that were there that, was, that were scamming things. Yeah. You know, didn't want to go to the shows, selling I mean, drugs. People, uh, people so. started, you know, having like dressing rooms, booths, uh, but there, it, it started out with like a couple of guys with a, you know, a few t-shirts in a, in a backpack. And it got to this thing where somebody had dressing rooms and mirrors and, you know, it's just, it just got to be too big. And there were too many bad episodes associated with it so that the Grateful Dead really started taking a lot of heat from places like Hartford and Hampton. That's why they think in 89, when they went back to Hampton for that great tour, uh, they, they did these guerrilla shows where you, so-called guerrilla shows, where they said we were the, they were the warlocks and they, they would only accept mail orders from people in the area code of, of Hampton or something. I don't know. It was, you know, they tried to be more controlling about who could actually come to the shows because they were really getting to the point where they couldn't play uh, the places they wanted to play. I mean, all of our, our cool venues in California eventually were denied us. Frost, the Greek, uh, Cal Expo, they, they managed to play until till the end. Um, but uh, they got to be too big and too popular with too big a scene following them uh, to, to play at the kind of intimate, fun places. Linda, questions. Yeah, Linda B wants to know if you've ever received any negative feedback about the magazine. If so, oh, yeah. or sure. Oh, uh, you know there. Were, oh yeah, not not a lot, but but you know there were always people who thought I was like too nice to the band. There were some people who didn't like to hear any criticism of the band. You know, every every show is somebody's greatest show ever. Like all the way through '95. You know, I can't believe you criticized Garcia. Or he didn't look good or something. I don't know. You know, all sorts of things like that. There were uh, we got some negative political feedback when we encourage people to vote democratic in 84 against Reagan, you know, what are you doing getting political? Like, you know, it's, um, but it was like, you know, it didn't, it didn't bother me. So no, it was, it was mostly positive. Cool. One more question. Sure. Uh, Jack wants to know what your feelings were when you had to end the magazine. Uh, do you feel like it came full circle? Was it a bit, you know, you mentioned how, um, the scene got pretty rough towards the end. So talk about your feelings towards the end and ending the publication. Well, we, we ended the magazine basically because we had two children. Um, when our first child was born, Kyle, in 1990, uh, that we, we started sort of cutting back a bit. And then when we had our second child, Haley slash Indigo uh, in 1993, um, that, that's when we stopped it. So we did annuals in 1990. And 1993, and those were really fun. I, I'm really proud of both those. I think I think there are our two best issues by far. They're our biggest issues. They're all slick paper and with full color photos. And those are those are among the ones that are that are that are available. Um, uh, if you go to the uh, to Jay's thing, the store. yeah, um, the store. And so, you know, I was, I was sad to end it. I, I did some writing for Dupree's Diamond News, which I thought was a pretty, pretty good magazine run by Johnny Dwork. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when I was there, it was 94 and 95, which were, I would say, down years for the Grateful Dead and for Garcia. So there's, uh, there's a bit of sadness in my writing and it doesn't have the same kind of ebullience uh, that 
almost anything in the Grateful Dead did mostly because that's, I was reflecting the vibe that I was getting from the Grateful Dead scene in 94 and 95. So it kind of ended in a sad note that way. Um, and then when Jerry died and I started working on the book, going around and interviewing everybody, you know, dozens and dozens of people was such an amazing experience uh, that it's kind of washed away the last two years of Grateful Dead history for me, just to hear the, the love uh, everybody had and all their great stories. And uh, I mean, he, he was so loved by everybody, faults and all, you know, they, they nobody, even recognizing all his, his many clay feet, you know, his, his, his faults, uh, nobody really had anything bad to say about Jerry. Uh, when I was interviewing people for the book, and that that was that was reassuring because I I didn't really have much bad to say about him either. I loved everything he did and everything the Grateful Dead did, pretty much from beginning to end. All right. Well, on that note, um, yes, the Golden Road came to an end because you had to stop neglecting your children, and they couldn't hold, <laughs> they couldn't hold an exacto blade just yet to cut out pages and galleys. They're both fans. Today. What's that? They're both fans at, at ages 26 and 29. They, they love it. They go to dead and company shows. They, uh, you know, awesome. We taught them well. You did. <laughs> uh, my kids too. So that's great. All right. Once again, this is a benefit for the Rex Foundation. If you want back issues of the Golden Road, I believe there's nine different ones that Blair has available, including both of those annuals. We set up a little temporary store on my website, which is rockoutbooks.com. It will proceed. Some of those proceeds will go to the Rex Foundation um, so please buy them, uh, please, you know, support, get them out of Blair's garage and, um, uh, you will enjoy them. They are collector's items. They are valuable. They're great reads even to this day. Thank you all for watching. Uh, we're going to take a few weeks off from photos with stories. We'll be back right after Labor Day, the weekend, the Sunday after, um, I've got a couple of really good ones scheduled for September and October. So just stay tuned to all the usual channels of where you find out where this is happening. And I'll, I'll reveal who those people are at that time. Uh, I think the 13th of September is the next one that we're going to do, Sunday, September 13th. Uh, Blair, Regan, thank you so, so much. Thanks. Really special. appreciate your time. That was super fun, super informative. Great stuff. Love you both. Um, yeah. um, we'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Cheers, everybody. Bye.